Well, we're going to cover a big subject tonight, the Federal Reserve. And uh, uh, interestingly enough, for many years, the analysts on Wall Street denied that they were Fed watchers. Because they, oh no, we don't do that because we do our own analysis and we draw up our independent uh, 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 things on stocks and so forth. But the fact is, they just watched the Fed and they knew when the Fed was going to raise or lower the interest rate. And uh, it was very easy for them. And at the same time, they officially denied that this is the way they operated. So uh, actually, the Federal Reserve made it a lot easier for Wall Street stockbrokers and speculators. Because the whole Federal Reserve system was set up originally to help speculation. That's all it was for. It was for uh, people who wanted to speculate and make big money fast. Otherwise, they wouldn't even bother to put it through. Because what we had before the Federal Reserve System was we had a national system of what is called one-name paper. I lent you $10, you gave me a note for $10, and you repaid me the $10. Well, the international banking community knew that there was a, uh, billions of dollars to be made from negotiable instrument, trading and debt. So... We went from one name paper to two name paper, three name paper. In other words, uh, you would owe a debt to somebody and the, that guy would sell it to somebody else for a small profit. He would sell it to somebody else and uh, everybody made a little money on the way. So they completely transformed the credit structure, not only of the United States, but of the entire world. And this trading in paper was called acceptances. You accepted a debt from someone else, so they had an official uh, banking name for it, acceptances. And the biggest acceptance dealers in the world were the Rothschilds and their agent, Paul Warburg, who had a company in New York called the International Acceptance Corporation. So Paul Warburg was the actual author of the Federal Reserve uh, Act. and. He was part of the crowd that went down to Jekyll Island on a secret meeting the week of Thanksgiving, 1910. Now, they had the Panic of 1907, which caused a lot of banks to fail and a lot of widespread misery. And so, supposedly, an outcry arose from the American people for banking reform. Well, this cry didn't come from the American people. It came from the Wall Street bankers. They were the ones that wanted banking reform because they wanted it on their own terms. But what they were conditioning the American people uh, to accept banking reform. And so uh, they had President Theodore Roosevelt create the National Monetary Commission in 1908. And to uh, the National Monetary Commission was going to bring banking reform to the American people. So. Uh, so who did they get for the National Monetary Commission? They got some of the leading bankers, Paul Warburg and some of the other people from Wall Street. Because uh, bankers always say, well, uh, if you're not a banker, you couldn't possibly know anything about banking. Well, you know to pay the uh, note every month at the bank, but that's all you know. So they got bankers to uh, study banking reform. So uh, these studies consisted of trips to Europe. And so the National Monetary Commission uh, took a couple of jaunts to Europe, and they were wined and dined all over Europe and uh, uh, by the Rothschilds and other bankers. But they came back with absolutely no results. This had gone on for two years. And so uh, they issued a report that we have met with some of the leading bankers of Europe and we have studied the problem and we're now going over our results. Well, there were no results. So uh, then they secretly went down to uh, Jekyll Island, the Millionaire's Club, and when they got there, everything was conspiratorial. They uh, sent all the servants on vacation, the, the uh, family servants, who of course knew them all, and they brought in servants for the occasion from the mainland who didn't know any of these people. And they agreed that they would only address each other by the first name. 
and it, they, they later called themselves the First Name Club. So Paul Bar Warburg was Paul, Henry Davidson was Henry, and uh, uh, Senator Aldrich was Nelson. I'm quite sure Senator Aldrich, who was quite a pompous guy, didn't like being called by his first name, but <laughs> that was part of the act that they were going through to put this over on the American people. So they actually sat down and drafted this bill uh, in a, the dining room of this hotel. And uh, about five years ago, I suggested to uh, one of the people I wrote for, L.T. Patterson of Criminal Politics, that he um, uh, have a meeting down there. I said, we'll call it a commemorative meeting, just to uh, memorialize the fellow. Well, uh, he agreed, and he got his people together, and we all went down to Jekyll Island for the uh, anniversary <laughs> celebration. And it worked out real well. Jekyll Island is a beautiful place. The hotel has been redone, and it's no longer the uh, Millionaire's Club, of course. It's a uh, Radisson, actually, Radisson of Jekyll Island. So uh, you've got a Radisson right across the street here. So they're a pretty good hotel chain. And uh, they have preserved the dining room just as it was when they wrote the act there in 1910. And they have plaques on the wall. And they say that, that the, uh, these people, met, these selfless bankers met here and on their own time and devised banking reform for the American people. And, and uh, so that's the way they put it across. But now they had to get this through Congress. And of course there was tremendous anti-banker sentiment in Congress, mostly from the Midwest and the Western states, which were the more independent people and also smaller populations. Because the Eastern Seaboard had always been controlled by the international bankers. And uh, that's why they have what they call the Eastern Seaboard Republicans, and they have the Republicans from the rest of the country. And they are totally different people because the Eastern Seaboard Republicans are the old bankers, very li what they call liberal Republicans, the Nelson Rockefeller people. And uh, then you have the real Republicans are in uh, the Midwest and the West. And they're mostly Republicans out in this part because people are very self-reliant and very independent. So when they went before Congress, they knew they had to have a good act. So they devised a plan that they would offer two different, two, two separate plans to Congress. Uh, the Republicans would offer the Aldrich plan, which was the plan that they had drafted down in Jekyll Island uh, to set up a central bank. And uh, the Democratic Party would offer uh, a Democratic plan, which they called the Federal Reserve Plan. And uh, they were the, actually the same plan. Some, some uh, commentators pointed out they were exactly alike. But uh, they, generally, the uh, people fell for it, and uh, there was a lot of publicity about the, there were attacks against the evil Wall Street Aldrich plan, and that, uh, but luckily, we were being offered an alternate plan, which would uh, be a people's plan by the Democratic Party to be called the Federal Reserve. So, if you were a good Democrat, you supported the Federal Reserve plan. If you were a good Republican, you reported, supported the Aldrich plan. And so, uh, but they really needed Woodrow Wilson. They knew he would sign the act into law if uh, he was elected president. So they wanted to elect him president in 1912 in order to put this deal over. And uh, the problem was he was not charismatic and uh, he had been uh, president of Princeton. He was a dry, pompous, academic person. Uh, absolutely no popular appeal whatsoever. But uh, Rockefeller and the National City Bank decided to go with him anyway, so they chose him as their candidate. But uh, President Taft, the incumbent uh, president, was a Republican, very popular. Uh, he was a, a really overweight guy. He weighed three or 400 pounds. Uh, he had to have a special bathtub at the White House, which uh, <laughs> you could put an elephant in. And, uh, but he was very popular because he was good-natured and. Uh, uh, we had prosperity, and so uh, it looked like Taft was going to be elected. So uh, they always come up with some kind of uh, conspiratorial operation. So they went to Theodore Roosevelt, who of course was very unhappy, 
uh, at not being in the White House. He had served his term, and that was over. So, uh, <clears throat> and there really wasn't anything for him to do. So they persuaded Roosevelt to split the Republican Party and run as an independent bull moose candidate, which he did. And so that elected uh, Wilson by a large majority. And so now Wilson had a mandate from the people to sign the Federal Reserve Act. So now they started the debate in Congress. Well, Congressman Lindbergh, the father of the aviator from uh, Minnesota, led the um, opposition. And Lindbergh was a very knowledgeable person. Uh, he was the lawyer for some, some of the bigger companies like Weyerhaeuser Lumber. He represented them. And in fact, he built a 30-room mansion up there at Little Falls on the lake, on the, uh, I guess it was on the Mississippi River. And uh, a year later, it burned down. So they built a smaller house there, and that house is there today, and that is the Lindbergh Museum. I was there two years ago, and it's a very interesting exhibit. It's not far from Minneapolis. So um, Lindbergh led the fight in Congress, and he had a lot of support against the uh, banking bill, not the Federal Reserve plan as it was offered. So uh, Paul Warburg himself and some of the other bankers, for the first time in their lives, had to come down from New York and actually lobby in the halls of Congress. So they made every promise in the world to get that act through. And uh, here is Paul Warburg, whom no one had ever seen in Washington before. He'd like to say in the background. Here he is walking through the halls of Congress to get people to, to uh, enact the Federal Reserve Act. And because Wilson was not popular, they took a Virginia congressman. Wilson also was born in Virginia, by the way. He's born in my hometown of Stanton, Virginia. And uh, Carter Glass was from uh, Lynchburg, and uh, he was very popular. So it was Carter Glass who got the Federal Reserve Act through Congress. And, uh, of course, he lived on that very well for the rest of his life. They made him senator. And uh, so... He became very old in office and uh, in the 30s. And in fact, uh, he was reelected twice after he was totally senile. He couldn't even make a public appearance or cast a voting Senate. But uh, uh, it was sort of like a referendum in uh, Russia or Germany, see. Uh, in Virginia, everything was totally controlled. So they reelected him twice after he was no longer able to even speak. <laughs> and uh, so this was just one of the triumphs of democracy that we have. But that was his reward for having gotten the Federal Reserve Act through, uh, that he was guaranteed a seat in the Senate for the rest of his life. And um, he was finally replaced. He died, so they had to replace. They replaced him by a congressman named Willis Robertson, who was part of the old Harry Byrd <coughs> machine. And uh, Harry Byrd himself was part of the uh, establishment. And um, his closest friend was Admiral Louis Strauss, who was a partner of Kuhn Loeb Company, the Rothschild Banking House in New York, which Paul Warburg was a partner of. So you, you had Harry Byrd uh, lobbying for the Federal Reserve Act, and you had uh, Willis Robertson, who's the father of uh, the great evangelist Pat Robertson whom I went to college with in, uh, uh, at Washington Lee. And at that time, he was a plump, lazy boy. I mean, he would never think of either going into religion or banking. And in fact, uh, uh, his grades were so low, he could not get into the Washington Lee Law School, even though his, his father was senator, chairman of the banking committee in Washington, and he was an old Lexington family. But he finally wound up going to Yale and and squeaking through Yale. I don't think he passed the, ever passed the bar exam. So then his wife said, well, let's, uh, let's do something for poor people. So they started a little church and uh, started broadcasting. And then he came down to Virginia Beach, and a friend of mine named Reverend Stallings helped him get set up down there. And uh, they later parted the company. I know the man well. And, uh, but Pat was on his way. And with this impeccable Wall Street background, Pat was able to build up a broadcasting empire. Uh, when your father has been 
chairman of the Senate Banking Committee, it does open a few doors, you know. So he always had plenty of financial support for this uh, television empire which he built up. If he hadn't had that family background, he would never gotten off the ground because nobody would put a dime in this kind of thing unless they were uh, had certain goals that they wanted to achieve. And of course they used uh, Pat Robertson politically ever since. Uh, he ran for president and he's done various things. And he's always there when they need him. That's the important thing. You, do, you can't always use these people every day. But to get back to the battle for the Federal Reserve Act in uh, Congress in 1913, Lindbergh was having enormous effect and it didn't look like they would ever get it passed, but Warburg kept uh, working. And uh, so what they did, they went through Congress and they made every congressman tremendous promises. And uh, so, but they still did not have a majority. So they waited until the Christmas vacation. And so uh, when Lindbergh and the other Midwestern and Western congressmen uh, went away for Christmas, they'd be gone three or four weeks because we didn't have jet planes at that time. So as soon as they left town, they brought the bill up before Congress and the Congress, uh, which barely had a quorum, hastily passed it on December the 23rd. Well, even the New York Times said, um, legislation of this importance has never been passed under such circumstances because con congressional courtesy dictated that you would not pass on major legislation while the other congressmen who opposed it were away. I mean, it was just common decency. And so uh, the Federal Reserve Act was actually fraudulent when it was passed because it would never have passed if the opponents had not left town. So it was legal, but it was immoral and uh, indecent that they passed it the way they did. It was the only way they knew they could ever get it through Congress. And uh, so they said, well, if that's what we have to do, we'll do it. And they did it. <laughs> and uh, so that is the real background of the Federal Reserve Act, which very people, few people know that. I actually researched in the New York Times and got the actual quotations, and I have it in my book, uh, the, the commentary, when it was finally passed. <clears throat> and so the world was waiting for the Federal Reserve Act for a very simple reason. Europe had not been able to have a war since 1885. They were all set for a war, but uh, all of the European countries had been bankrupted by their central banks. A central bank always bankrupts a country because they spend all the money. And uh, so uh, they knew the only way they could finance a world war was from the wealth of the American people. But without a central bank, they couldn't do that. So. As soon as they got the Federal Reserve Act enacted into law on December 23, 1913, a few weeks later, J.P. Morgan Company, which had been represented uh, at the Jekyll Island meeting by his lieutenant, Henry P. Davison, Morgan himself did not want to appear personally at the Jekyll Island meeting because it would compromise the whole situation if they knew J.P. Morgan was there. That meant it was a banker's bill, so he stayed away. And Henry Davison, who was not so well known, was his right-hand man. And uh, he organized the American Red Cross also. And uh, so Davison was a Morgan's man at the uh, Jekyll Island Conference. And uh, so the Morgan Company has always played a large role in the Federal Reserve. In fact, Alan Greenspan, the present chairman, before he was appointed to the Federal Reserve Board, was a partner of J.P. Morgan Company which probably qualified him for that job, you know, and, uh, or at least J.P. Morgan thought he did, so that, that's why he got the job. See, so all these uh, Federal Reserve Board people are chosen by the Wall Street bankers. Obviously, the president, who nominally rubber stamps these appointments, he didn't know any of these people. He doesn't know anything about banking. I don't know when we've had a president who was a banker because bankers... Uh, for a long time have been in poor repute among the American people, and with very good reason. So if you could imagine a banker running for president, he wouldn't get very far. So what you have to do is pick other people and then put up the money for them to be elected. So these uh, bankers have always put their mo people on the Federal Reserve Board, and as I say, the first thing they did was lend 
Great Britain $400 million from J.P. Morgan. Well, that was to start the World War I. It was like a declaration of war, but no one knew it. They thought, well, uh, it's just an ordinary loan. And uh, so then uh, J.P. Morgan actually kept the money and became the purchasing agent for Great Britain in the United States. So he spent all that money in this country buying munitions for England and shipping the munitions to England so they could start the war. <coughs> so that's how it was done. <coughs> and of course, Germany, after the war, they wanted to try the Kaiser for <coughs> uh, planning to make war against its peaceful neighbors and so forth. Well, actually, the Kaiser didn't know any of this was going on or that he was being set up and that uh, Germany was going to be attacked. So anyway, that's the way it worked. They started World War I, and uh, only because they had the Federal Reserve System. And once they got it started, they realized whether well, the central bank is going to be great. And sure enough, they did the same thing in '39. They started Act Two of the World War I, which became World War II. And uh, of course, both times we had a president who campaigned on off for office on the pledge he would keep us out of war. Wilson campaigned in 1916, and he boasted to the American people, I have kept you out of war, uh, and so you should re-elect me. And then, of course, as soon as he was re-elected, he took us into the war. Well, Roosevelt campaigned, he said, American boys will never die in foreign fields. And he stumped the entire country, assuring everybody uh, of this. And um, so then, uh, after he was re-elected, of course, uh, uh, they had uh, uh, decoded the Japanese radio, and uh, they knew that the Japanese fleet was on its way to attack Pearl Harbor. So they made sure not to tell anybody, because the Japanese was sailing under strict orders. If they were detected en route, or if they had any reason to believe that the uh, Americans were expecting them, they were to turn around and go home which would have meant the U.S. would not have gotten into the war. So the night before Pearl Harbor, three people met at the White House. That was with Roosevelt. Uh, that was uh, George C. Marshall, Chief of Staff, and Bernard Baruch, who was the banker, who was the intimate of the presidents. And they were sitting there absolutely terrified in fear that the Japanese would turn back and that 3,500 American boys would not, not be killed the next day. And uh, so anyway, their night's vigil uh, paid off, and the Japanese attacked, and uh, we were in the war. So that's how it was all done. One of the greatest acts of treason against the American people, and the fact that all these uh, American boys died in the ships, you know, and sank and were killed and bombed. They were bombed. And uh, they had not an inkling that all this was happening, although... It was, in, they knew in Washington it was coming. So to cover up for themselves, the Roosevelt administration then uh, indicted uh, Admiral Kimmel and General Short, the two commanders of Pearl Harbor, on the grounds that they had been negligent, that, uh, that they had let the Japanese come in there and attack them. And of course, they had not a clue that any of this was happening and uh, that Washington knew all about it and refused to tell them. In fact, I think the, uh, <coughs> the army in Washington did send, by ordinary first-class mail, a note to the Pearl Harbor commanders that uh, they might expect a Japanese invasion. And it arrived there a couple days after Pearl Harbor, of course. But uh, that was the most urgent way that they had of notifying uh, our troops in Pearl Harbor that the Japanese were going to attack. So it worked out just right, and uh, we were in the war, and everything was underway. So this is how a uh, central bank works. It's constantly active politically. It's constantly planning for war. And the reason they plan for war is, like Ezra Pound said many years ago, uh, wars are created to make debt because... Uh, Ordinary peacetime commerce can be profitable. Uh, goods are traded and uh, people are employed. But war gives you the big money, 
when you get into war, you have billions and billions. And of course, during World War II, we had a very interesting system uh, of production. It was called uh, cost plus, cost plus 10%. So the more money, if you were manufacturing munitions, boats or guns or whatever, for the government, the more money you spent, the more money you made. So, so naturally, you were very generous to your uh, uh, workers, and you paid them enormous amounts of money, because every time you gave them a raise, you made an extra 10% on the raise. So, so nobody balked at this, and this, this was what they called the miracle of production of uh, World War II. And all it was, they had unlimited funds from the government, and uh, of course, they made their money, and uh, they got very rich. So, uh, in 1943, we did have a couple of successes, and Ezra Pound broadcast from Radio Rome at that time, and he said, uh, uh, well, you've had a couple of successes now, and you're scared out of your pants that the war is going to end, which, of course, they didn't want it to end in 1943, and that's why they fought World War II to prolong it as long as possible. They had the... Uh, step-by-step uh, -step approach in the Pacific. Instead of attacking Japan, they st attacked each one of these little islands That's at stupid. tremendous cost. Well, it was, a, it was stupid, but it kept the war going. Oh, yeah. <laughs> See, if it attacked Japan, uh, it could have been over in a couple of weeks. That wasn't what they wanted. And it was the same way in Europe. Uh, they landed in Sicily and fought their way all the way up Italy through the mountains and so forth, uh, which kept things going an extra year. Because if they had attacked France or Germany uh, by land at that time, the war had been over in six months. But as they didn't want it that way, and so they prolonged it to 1945. So real strategy in a war is not how to win it, but how to keep it going as long as possible. That is when you have a bank behind it, because the bank wants uh, to drag it out and uh, make it as costly as possible, not only in money, but also in human lives. I mean, they were gambling with American lives uh, when they prolonged the war and fought through the islands in the Pacific, fought up Italy. There was never, militarily, there was never any explanation that you could offer to justify this kind of campaign. And I guess Hitler knew what was going on anyway, because he was financed by the Bank of England. In fact, uh, they put out the myth that uh, the evil Hitler was financed by German industrialists, but in fact Hitler was disliked by the German manufacturing class, and uh, so he had to go to uh, Governor Montague Norman, governor of the Bank of England, uh, to get his money. And he was broke when he w went into office in 1933. So we had to fly a couple of lawyers to uh, Cologne to meet with him, and to assure him that uh, he would get the money to keep him going. So, uh, you know, they have war crimes for t people like that. They had war crimes trials for people who plotted war. Well, the two war criminals in this case were John Foster Dulles and Alan Dulles of the firm of Sullivan and Cromwell, who were the lawyers for the international bankers. And the Dulles brothers went to Cologne and assured Hitler he would have money to keep the Nazi administration going. And uh, <clears throat> he was actually financed, too, by the Schroeder Company of uh, London. And uh, one of the Schroeder directors, F.C. Tarks, was a director of the Bank of England. So he had the governor of the Bank of England and Tarks behind him. And with the money of the Bank of England behind him, Hitler was uh, assured of uh, having a Nazi regime and of... Uh, starting World War II, which was the whole plan anyway. Uh, they didn't care what Hitler did as long as he got World War II going. And so that worked out, and uh, that's how they had it. Without Hitler, there would never have been a Second World War, which means that the uh, bankers would have lost many billions of dollars in profits. So he was a good investment for them, and uh, so that's why they call him a monster today, because they don't want anybody to know about their association with him. Or Now, they did try to indict Lieutenant General Schroeder, a German, uh, who was head of the SS uh, for war crimes after 
the uh, end of World War II. So he was arrested very briefly and held in a camp and uh, under British uh, jurisdiction and quietly dropped. He was never tried. And he was the man who made the whole Hitler Nazi administration possible. So uh, the war crimes trials, the Nuremberg trials, they were recently reshown again. Uh, and, and the only reason they ever held the Nuremberg trials was that they wanted to silence the uh, German generals who knew, who had knowledge about all this duplicity and how the Bank of England had financed Hitler. Well, they wanted to permanently silence them, so they hung them. And their crime was not war crimes at all. It was the fact they knew too much. And they were silenced, and uh, they managed to conceal uh, the background of what was going on. So this is how central banks work. They use everybody, and when they're through with you, they get rid of you by whatever means they hang you or, or may you just disappear. And uh, so uh, this is the Federal Reserve system that we uh, think is a unique American institution. And the Federal Reserve Bank of New York alone, now there are 12 banks, of course, 12 Federal Reserve Banks, but the, uh, the a bank in New York is called the Money Center Bank, and that is the, uh, the president of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York makes all the major decisions. Now, there was a piece in the paper yesterday about the uh, president of the Federal Reserve Bank of Minnesota, Minneapolis, and uh, in fact, he's, he's a minor figure. He has no authority whatsoever. All the power is in New York. But they try to promote the other 11 presidents of these other 11 banks uh, just to make them feel important, I guess. But uh, the Money Center Bank has always done everything. And it was the directors of this one bank in New York, the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, which uh, financed communism. And uh, they were active in helping the Nazis. And they were uh, active in helping the fascists in Italy. So all of these great political movements of the 20th century came right out of the uh, Federal Reserve Bank of New York. And uh, that alone is uh, a historical fact, which is very significant. But if you send your uh, offspring to Yale or Princeton or Harvard, they will never hear one word about any of this. <laughs> so, I don't care how much money you spend, they're not going to get this information. It's all a matter of record, but the professors know that they have very cushy jobs. They pay their professors very well now, about 150000 a year. They get long vacations. They get all sorts of special perks, uh, uh, trips to uh, Europe for conferences and things like that. Their children all get scholarships at the best colleges. So uh, they're well taken care of. So they don't rock the boat. And they know to a T what they need to tell their students and what to keep from them. And of course, the main thing is they keep everything for, from them. They really don't know anything. And uh, it's a very unfortunate situation because when you see the price of college education in this country today, I think it's about 120000 for a four-year stint, and to realize that those students are being denied practically all information about what's going on, <laughs> it's really robbery of a very gross kind. But that's the way the system is operated. And uh, the reason is that all of these so-called Ivy League schools, like you have the Harvard School of Business, the most prestigious business school in the United States. Well, J.P. Morgan had a partner in the First National Bank called George Baker. George Baker was president of the bank, and they worked together for many years. Of course, George Baker made hundreds of millions of dollars. So uh, he gave $25 million to Harvard for the School of Business. And the name is right there today, George F. Baker School of Business, because he gave them all the money. Well, why did George F. Baker give $25 million to Harvard for the School of Business? Because he knew that the students there would never be told anything about what's going on. In other words, he made an investment. He made an investment in the future that uh, the students would never find out what, what, was act, what they were, had been doing. And that's true. The Harvard School of Business <coughs> was set up to return short-term profits. And anybody who's gone through the Harvard School of Business uh, and become head of a Fortune 500 corporation, which many of them do, has the worst possible training. 
because they're not taught long-term development strategy. They're taught short-term profits. Make it in three months. Make junk and sell it fast. Make some money. And that's the total philosophy of that school. Well, that came from George Baker because short-term profits, your banker wants you to make quick profits and pay off your loans to him. So uh, he's not interested in in a five-year or ten-year development program where you make something really good and make it, you know, something that can be admired throughout the world. They want you to turn out cheap junk, sell it fast, make a quick profit, and pay the banknotes. So uh, this is the philosophy of the um, all the schools of business because they follow the, the example of Harvard School of Business, Wharton School of Finance. These are the models. So they all fall into line and uh, teach our students the same thing, which has been very destructive because American corporations have actually fallen behind in development over the last 25 years. Uh, Japan and Germany, of course, have pushed way ahead and have done much better because they do not have the short-term strategy. Uh, the only way you could make real profits and build your company is to have a long-term a strategy of development, research, building up your market, satisfying your customers. But uh, uh, American corporations are run like McDonald's. They turn out hamburgers real fast and uh, they make money. <laughs> but uh, what's the future on that? I mean, the, the McDonald hamburger 10 years from now will be just like it is now. Maybe they'll extract a little more of the uh, flavor from it, but uh, they've done that already, so <laughs> I don't think that'll happen. So. Uh, so when I was talking about people on Wall Street watching the Fed, they are operating from this same short-term results uh, strategy. And uh, so they really know just about what the Fed is going to do throughout an entire year. At the beginning of the year, they have an idea of what the interest rates are going to be or interest reductions for that entire year. But they pretend that it's a great mystery, this tremendous secrecy, they still will not publish the minutes of the Federal Reserve meetings of the Federal Reserve Ch uh, Board. Now, the Federal Reserve controls uh, the economy through two ways. One is the interest rate, which is the price of money. Well, they control the economy through the interest rate. If they raise the interest rate, less money is available for investment. So prices go uh, uh, will fall on uh, <coughs> Wall Street because the money, uh, money to buy stocks is reduced. But the real operation is done through what is called the Federal Reserve Open Market Committee. Now, I've been writing about and studying the... Uh, <coughs> Federal Reserve Open Market Committee for over 50 years. Well, Time Magazine has, uh, you know, very highly paid journalists. So on March the 23rd of 2000, they did a feature story on the Open Market Committee. I printed pictures of the members, told how they operated and everything. They discovered this in the year 2000. Well, I discovered it in 1948. <laughs> so that puts me a little ahead of them. <laughs> And Time Magazine, of course, was founded by uh, these same bankers in 1923. So from 1923 to the year 2000, they never knew that there was such a thing as the Federal Reserve Open Market Committee. Well, what is the uh, importance of the Federal Reserve Open Market Committee? Well, it determines the volume of money available for investment at any time. The Open Market Committee buys or sells government bonds on the open market. Now, when they want prosperity and uh, they want the market to go up, they buy government bonds. And so that creates more money. And uh, so there's more money available for investment. And the next day after they do this, the stock market will go up 100 points. So anybody who happens to know uh, that that's going to happen, and there are people who know, uh, is in a very good position. But the average American investor has no clue as to this great secrecy of the Federal Reserve Open Market Committee, so they don't know it until it's printed in the paper that the Federal Reserve is uh, buying bonds. Now, they do the opposite to
to depress the market. The Open Market Committee will, will uh, uh, sell the government bonds, and uh, so that extinguishes the debt, and that reduces the amount of money in the system, and uh, it's like turning off the spigots. No more water coming out. So then the stock market drops precipitously. Here again, it's quite advantageous to know the day before that this is going to happen. And, of course, the general public never knows. But there are people who do know. And uh, when you have somebody like Greenspan, chairman of the board, from J.P. Morgan and Company, uh, now he doesn't call up J.P. Morgan and tell them they're going to do this. J.P. Morgan calls him up and tells him to do this. <laughs> so, so it's not that he's given them any advance information. They're, he's just doing what he's told to do. And this is the way it's been. As I say, the whole Federal Reserve System was set up for speculators, for these people to have advanced knowledge of uh, monetary movements, <clears throat> how much uh, the price of money, the interest rate, and the volume of money that's going to be available for investment. Either it's going to grow or it's going to be less, but uh, they decide all that ahead of time, and so they make enormous fortunes. And so the other investors, they have to do what they call Fed watching, they have to watch and guess what the Federal Reserve is going to do. Because I say, now, people have sued to have the uh, minutes of the Federal Reserve Board meetings made public. In fact, we had a chairman of the uh, House Banking Committee a few years ago, Henry Gonzalez, uh, from Texas. And Henry Gonzalez sued them several times to try to uh, get these uh, minutes. Uh, and to avoid the secrecy, but he never got anywhere because you go into courts on a deal like that. And, of course, the judges are Federal Reserve judges. They may not be labeled that, but uh, they always go with the Federal Reserve. And many people have asked me why I never sued the Federal Reserve during all these years, knowing what I know about them and having it all documented in this book. Well, to launch a suit like that, you do need quite a lot of money, half a million or a couple million dollars, and, of course, uh, the advantage the Federal Reserve Board has as a central bank, uh, whatever money you can put into a lawsuit, they can print enough, ten times that much money to fight you. <laughs> now, that's right. So if I was able to print money, I would sue the Federal Reserve tomorrow. But, uh, unfortunately, my resources are very modest. And most people who are interested in this sort of thing, they're very modest. Because you do not get very wealthy people to uh, get into this fight. Ross Perot would never put up, put up any money for you to sue the Federal Reserve Board because they'd wipe him out tomorrow. And Ross Perot played the political game for years before he became a presidential campaign uh, camp, uh, candidate. He was the largest single contributor to President Nixon. He gave him $300,000. Uh, was, he was the largest single contributor, <coughs> and he didn't do that because he liked Nixon or anything else. He did that because he was maneuvering to get these enormous Social Security and other uh, uh, computer data contracts from the government. So he, fought, he set up a company called Electronic Data Systems, EDS, which uh, was programmed to handle these enormous uh, paperwork things that were set up by these Social Security Administration, uh, workman's compensation, all these things, and he had the only system which could handle it. But having the only system uh, didn't mean anything, it didn't mean that much, because uh, no matter what kind of government contract you get, you got to pay off to get it. I mean, nothing for nothing, that's the old motto of Washington. They claim that they used to have it on the wall in the House office building over one congressman's door, nothing for nothing. <laughs> so I don't know if that's true. But anyway, even Ross Perot, who had the system to handle all this, and of course these were enormous contracts, uh, he still had to pay his way in. So he donated 300000 to Nixon, and uh, he got the contracts. And of course he became a billionaire, uh, because these were very huge contracts. So, so Ross Perot then came out as a... Uh, a white knight on a charger. He was going after uh, Congress, and he was going to, to bring a businessman's uh, 
point of view to Washington. Well, he was a businessman. Uh, in fact, all of his business had been done with Washington. Yes. Uh, <laughs> but uh, the idea that he was going to change anything was ridiculous because uh, he was part of the system. And see, Bill Gates was the same way. Bill Gates became the wealthiest man in the world. And uh, well, with his Microsoft Corporation, his computer operations. And, uh, but these people in Washington were getting very disgusted with Bill Gates. And he didn't know it because he didn't know what was going on. He was spending a million and a half a year in Washington. Here he was, biggest corporation in the country, richest man. He's spending a million and a half. Well, my gosh, even a, a delicatessen would spend more than that. <laughs> so uh, they were getting very angry with him, and they realized they had to send him a message. So they had the Justice Department indict him for monopoly. And he finally got the message. He's spent now spending about $25 million in lobbying, $25 million a year lobbying in Washington. So now he's become a member of the team, and... Uh, the Microsoft thing is not going anywhere, of course. This judge ruled against him, but that was only so you could appeal. Um, lawyers know that uh, they always want you to lose the first go-round because then you can appeal for years, and uh, this brings a cash flow into the firm. And uh, the firm, of course, is a law firm, and uh, uh, to have a firm, you have to have money coming in. So uh, this thing will drag on, and... Uh, they're not going to split Microsoft uh, into two companies because they haven't the faintest idea how to do it. But uh, the threat is there. And I will say Gates has taken it all very well. He realizes he was set up, but uh, it was his own fault. He sh well, I had thought for years, why doesn't Bill Gates start spending a little money in Washington? Why doesn't he share the wealth like everybody else? But he had no idea that he's out there on the West Coast. He had no clue as to this is the way things are done. <laughs> But under a totally corrupt Federal Reserve System, yeah, this is how politics work. Yeah, he got his education very quick. But um, so that is the way that the Federal Reserve System works. And uh, it, it is total corruption from the very beginning. It, uh, it began as a criminal conspiracy. Now, people used to ask me, well, what is the Federal Reserve? It's federal, which means it's government and it has reserves. And uh, it's a, bo it's a uh, system. Well, it's actually, it's not federal, and it has no reserves. It doesn't need any reserves. When you could print all the money you want, why would you need any reserves? I mean, if you need $10 billion, you go down and print it. You don't have to have any, you don't go to the bank vault and drag out $10 billion. Uh, just print some more. So, uh, and it's not a system at all. It's a robbery system. I call it the federal robbery system rather than Federal Reserve, since there are no reserves, but there's certainly plenty of robbery, because every person in this country is being robbed by these people. And uh, when they raise the interest rate, they're robbing you. Uh, when Greenspan started uh, raising the interest rate, it means you've got to cough up another $1,500 a month on your mortgage or lose your house and go live in a trailer. So, uh, and you haven't got any raise. I mean, you're not making 1500 a year more. But uh, the interest rate pushes you into to that position. You've got to come up with the money or lose your home. And uh, this is what uh, the Federal Reserve does to people. Uh, you've got a note on your car, and suddenly the interest rate goes up on that. Every Or you borrow money for your business, and that goes up, and maybe your business is not making that much profit. You lose your business. So these are very serious and uh, uh, very cruel things because... When these bankers raise the interest rates, uh, they don't worry about whether you can meet your bills or not. If you don't meet your bills, they'll foreclose on you, take your business, and you go to work for them at a much lower salary. And so that's how it's done. But it is a system uh, of exploitation, of robbery, because when you take money from people and don't give them anything in return, that's robbery. Because under all normal commerce, uh, if you buy something or spend money, you get a product in exchange. With the Federal Reserve, you get nothing except the debt. You get an increase in your debt, and that's it. You do not get any goods or any advantage of any kind. You've got the same house you were living in, but it's costing you an extra $1,500 a month. 
and uh, that's about how much Greenspan has raised the average mortgage in the country. So if you can imagine, everybody in the United States is paying an extra $1,500 a month, and uh, they've got to raise that money by whatever means they can, sell, sell assets, uh, or sell the house, and move to a smaller house, which many people have done. Well, a uh, fixed rate mortgage is not affected, but yeah, many many of the mortgages are not fixed rate anymore. They they put put them on a sliding scale. So you must have one of the old, very desirable fixed rates. I guess all of them I get are fixed rates. I've never been on a sliding. Well, uh, well, all of them were fixed rates for a long time, and then. You know, they were tipped off that they're going to start raising the interest rate, so they started moving them over into, uh, 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 I don't know exactly how they set it up, but they make variable mortgage. They move to variables. So you've got the fixed rate, you're okay, they can't do anything to you. The thing I want to do in the future is interest rates go up and it's going to cost me more to, for the cost of business for well, the future borrowings I have. But, oh, definitely. But for so, things, it doesn't affect me at all. So you're locked into the fixed rate, you're okay. But uh, but if you go into another business or something, you're going to pay the higher rate. Yeah, so but also all the businesses not to pay higher rates for their loans, which means they're going to have to raise prices. Yeah, and the business the business loans are where they really make their money because most businesses have to borrow money to start up or to expand and so forth. So the the, the house mortgage is not the ideal example because people in house mortgages are on a more fixed income, but businesses uh, are totally at risk. They've got to raise the money or they won't uh, have a business. So it's the businesses that really get hurt by this. But you don't hear the Republican Party complaining about the interest rates and so forth uh, because the Republican Party, being liberal Republican, uh, are for the bankers. And uh, they go along with the Federal Reserve on everything. And it's amazing, too, what unanimous approval there is throughout the United States for the Federal Reserve System. You'll never hear a businessman or a politician criticizing uh, the Federal Reserve. The only criticism for Greenspan's six interest rate uh, uh, increases since the first of the year came from the Wall Street Journal, which is sort of a voice of sanity. <laughs> yeah, and sure and they, had, they had a number of uh, articles on their editorial page in which they, they criticized... Um, <clears throat> uh, Greenspan's action. Well, you know, they they absolutely laughed at his claims that uh, we were under uh, inflationary pressure. Well, there was no inflationary pressure at all. They published the actual figures, and there was no inflationary pressure. So, uh, so then Greenspan, because of this attack on the Wall Street Journal, he kind of changed his t uh, tactics. He said, well, what he was attacking was the wealth factor. Well, that made it uh, look like he was going after the rich. So everything, everybody thinks that's okay. Go ahead and, and soak the rich. But uh, it's not the rich uh, that pay the bills. It's, it's the middle income and poor people that pay the bills. Uh, the rich always get a uh, special deal, you know, special discount, or, or they own the bank that owns the note, and they're paying themselves. But... Uh, uh, middle income and uh, poor people don't have that advantage. So they are the ones who are the ultimate victims of all of these policies of the Federal Reserve Board because uh, wealthy people always benefit from these things. They have it set up so they benefit. That's why I said that the original Federal Reserve plan was conceived by very rich people who wanted to get even richer. There were no, no poor people at the... Uh, Jekyll Island meeting. There were no middle-income people. These people were already uh, very wealthy, and they had this personal view of themselves as uh, pirates. They really felt like they were sailing the seas under the Jolly Roger. And in fact, if you look at the names of their yachts, they all had yachts. So uh, George Baker's yacht was called uh, the Viking, and J.P. Morgan's yacht was called the Corsair, which is, Corsair is a raider. So they really 
believed in themselves as pirates. I mean, these were not people who were out to do good in the world or to help anybody. They were out to rob and pillage because that's where the real money comes in. I mean, you can work all your life at a modest salary or you can go out and rob people and make a lot of money very quickly. Well, these people deliberately chose the path of robbery and it's the only path that they have. And uh, they donate large sums to churches and universities of the stolen money, of course. And, uh, but they've set that up so they get a big tax write-off. Usually it hardly costs them anything because uh, they learned long ago that uh, when you're robbing people, it's better to promote an image that you do good, you know. <laughs> so that's what they do. These are all great philanthropists, all these Tony people. Rockefeller, did he hand out the dimes? To Rockefeller the kids, handed out dimes, yeah. To the kids, you know. Oh, yes. Yes, he handed out uh, dimes. No folding money, but just dimes. Dime, yeah. <laughs> In fact, he'd get the dimes by the roll, you know, and he would hand them out. But that was, that was his great thing. Well, uh, to give old John D. credit, his sons and grandchildren don't even give anybody dimes. They don't give them anything. <laughs> you, never, you never heard of David or Nelson Rockefeller giving anybody a dime or giving them anything. So uh, he was more generous than they were. But uh, old John D. set up the uh, Rockefeller Foundation, and he was so hated at that time. Now remember, this is the man who organized the Federal Reserve meeting, and uh, his son married Nelson Aldrich's uh, daughter. So Nelson Aldrich represented money and privilege in the U.S. of 1900. Republican majority leader, uh, he owned banks in Rhode Island, uh, he had stock and everything, and he lived in a huge mansion, and uh, his daughter married John D. Rockefeller. So in fact, that's how Nelson Aldrich uh, Rockefeller was named after the man who chaired the Federal Reserve Board meeting. So that's how involved these people were in this whole thing. And uh, <clears throat> John D. Rockefeller's Jr.'s sons were named the Fortunate Five, you know, Nelson and uh, David and Lawrence. Uh, they were the Fortunate Five. They were the, the five wealthiest young men in the United States and the most desirable for marriages, of course. Uh, they were the best catch because they were all going to inherit the Rockefeller fortune. And um, <clears throat> the people who bought the original Federal Reserve stock in 1914 <clears throat> had a monopoly because they in included in the Federal Reserve Act of 1913 <clears throat> that the stock could never be bought or sold on any exchange. So if you wanted to buy stock in this magical money machine which printed money, you couldn't do it because they'd set it up that it would only be available to the people who bought it initially and who, of course, would hold on to it through their families. And uh, so then Rockefeller set up the Rockefeller Foundation and put his Federal Reserve stock in that so that it could never be touched anyway. So uh, that's where it is today. And uh, that is part of the capital of the Rockefeller Foundation. Well, Rockefeller was so hated that when he tried to charter his Rockefeller Foundation through Congress, he couldn't do it. So he finally chartered it through the legislature of New York, which he owned anyway. And it was never chartered as a national foundation because uh, nobody in Washington dared, the Senate didn't but dare vote for it. So he had it there for two years, he couldn't get it. So he went back to New York and chartered it. And the Rockefeller Foundation then financed the takeover of the uh, medical profession through his Rockefeller Institute for Medical Research and they have given us this big drug deal that we have today with all of the uh, pills and all of the uh, the whole complicated uh, uh, medical insurance and medical practice of today all came from John D. Rockefeller. Why? Was he really interested in people's health? Uh, no. He saw he had the oil monopoly and he was looking for other things, so he went into the medical profession, took that over. I went into the banking business and took that over from the Federal Reserve System. So this was a man who was growth-minded, as they say. <laughs> he just kept growing and growing, dominating more and more. And as he went into the, each of these fields, he took them over totally. For instance, in the medical field, he set up a system where 
hospitals could only be accredited by the state legislature. And uh, <clears throat> so, uh, so then he controlled the legislature, so he now controlled all of the hospitals. So if you wanted to set up a hospital which, say, would offer uh, free care to a certain number of indigent people or something like that, you couldn't get a, the legislature wouldn't approve it. You wouldn't, so you wouldn't be accredited. And without accreditation, uh, it was against the law to operate. They'd come and close you down. Armed police would come and shut the place down and throw you out. <laughs> so this is, uh, they always fall upon force as a final factor because only by force can they force people to do the things that, that, that to rob them the way they do. You've got to have force. There's no way you could sit down and persuade uh, the ordinary person to give you all of his money. You have to use a gun. <laughs> so that's what all of these uh, Federal Reserve influenced uh, legislatures, uh, revenue agencies, everything, they all, the force is their only solution. And uh, the uh, IRS particularly has a habit of uh, demanding initially at least five times what they know that you owe. If they think you owe 60000 they'll send you a notice for 300000 Well, the average person is totally devastated by a demand for 300000 They don't have it. They don't owe it. They never owed it. So this conditions you to start negotiating and bring down the 300000 to a more reasonable figure. So you wind up, you may owe them 60000 but you wind up paying 120000 because you you got to pay more in order to get a settlement. So that's how they operate. They've been doing that for many years. Well, this is fraudulent. The uh, IRS knows when they send out the claim that it's fraudulent, and you know it's fraudulent, but you can't go to court and, and uh, prove that because any court would say, well, the IRS agents uh, worked this up from the information they had and from their statistics, and uh, uh, we can't challenge that. So uh, a lot of some people have committed suicide because of these uh, impositions. And as I say, the income tax was set up solely to cover up the fact that the Federal Reserve bankers had gotten a license from uh, the government to print as much money as they wanted and there's no restraints on it whatsoever. That's why they needed the income tax in the first place, was because they had to have some system of control, and that the t income tax was that system. And they've been using it ever since, and uh, it's invalid now, and it was invalid at that time. And as Bill Benson pointed out, to get the income tax amendment through the state legislatures, in every case, they use subterfuge, and uh, in most cases, it was never even ratified in the first place. But uh, they went ahead and listed it as being approved. And when he started doing his research, uh, he was amazed at going to legislature after legislature and finding out it was totally fraudulent. It had never been ratified in the first place. <laughs> so nobody actually owes any income tax at all because uh, uh, the amendment was passed under fraudulent circumstances. And the man who approved it as Secretary of State was Philander Knox, who was the Wall Street lawyer for J.P. Morgan and the big uh, the bankers who wanted the income tax. They knew they had to have the income tax, that they could not work the Federal Reserve uh, system unless they had the income tax, because that was the only means of control that they had. And the uh, <coughs> income tax then became a weapon. Uh, they used force against people. They'd go in and seize your business, seize your home. Uh, I had a friend in Washington that uh, owed tax, or they said he owed tax. And uh, so he came home and went to bed at night. And during the night, they came and took his car. He just had a little Volkswagen. They took his car. And uh, to show you how blackmail and extortion is behind all of this, uh, he went to to the IRS and bought his own car back for a few cents on the dollar. And uh, as long as the money changes hands, uh, they're told to bring in money and they bring in money. They're all on a quota system and uh, they have to bring in money or they never get promoted. 
So he bought his own car back for like something like two hundred dollars, but now he had a car again. <laughs> and uh, that's the kind of go uh, this is a this is a so-called government. This is not a government at all. Yes. Are we allowed to ask questions during this discussion? Or uh, we yes, I think we've reached the point now we've, of the workshop where we're going to the question and answer. So you go ahead. Uh, I have a question. I first understood that when they passed the Federal Reserve Act on me, on uh, Christmas Eve, that there were actually only four people in the room. Isn't that true? It wasn't a quorum. They called it a quorum, but it was really four people in the room. Well, they said it was a quorum, but I wasn't there. And these people lie about everything, so I don't, I don't think there probably was a quorum. But I don't know how you'd ever prove that, you well, see. They had, they had, I mean, he seems to know, too. I mean, we know that there were four people in the room, and we knew what said. What well, see, the New York Times didn't cover any of that. And, of course, my source was the New York Times. Uh -huh. But I don't doubt it that it was totally fraud. I don't see how uh -huh. they could ever have passed it uh, when all these congressmen had left town. There's no way they could have had a quorum. Well, they did the same thing with the Brady Bill. Oh, the Brady Bill, yeah, exactly, exactly. sure. Exactly the same thing. Yeah, whatever they want, they get. <laughs> right. They yeah. waited until everybody left to go on vacation, and that's when they did their thing in the 11th hour. Well, it was 11 o'clock at night. 11 o'clock at night, yeah, they do that. I used to live in Washington, and we would see the lights on in the Capitol building when they were doing some one of these things. Uh, George Stimson, who founded National Press Club, uh, he and I would have dinner together sometime and walk home at night. He lived at the George Washington Inn, which was just past... Uh, the uh, congressional offices, and um, well, we passed there one night. It was a summer night, and and all the lights were blazing, and all the uh, and the, and the Capitol, and uh, they were debating the Marshall Bill, which was one of the great Rockefeller giveaways, because all the Marshall Plan they couldn't call it the Rockefeller Plan, which is what it was. So they put George Marshall's name on it. It became known as the Marshall Plan. But it was actually the Rockefeller plan to keep uh, war production going because the Rockefeller plants, of course, the war was over and they would have to close down. So they kept the uh, plants in production, only now they called it aid. And so, so they kept sending stuff to Europe at uh, American taxpayers' expense for Rockefeller's profit, and it was called aid. They gave, it, they gave them the stuff. <laughs> yes. I would like to have, I mean, I understand up until World War II and everything that happened. It, did you, it, I mean, I don't know if you have enough time to kind of give us an overview of what's happened since then. Where is this all going? Well, it's just going, it's, it's business as usual. They're continuing the same old system. As long as they got the Federal Reserve Board in place, they can uh, raise the interest rate, lower the interest rate, uh, make the stock market tighten up, expand the stock market. Uh, no, they've got a very workable system. I don't see any changes in it unless they're forced to change. And the uh, Congress is totally controlled. There's only one person in Congress today, Congressman Ron Paul, whom I know very well, who will criticize the Federal Reserve. He's a lone voice. Well, in Washington, when you're a lone voice, you're really alone. <laughs> Everybody knows you're alone. They know that Ron Paul is standing there, that he has no supporters, in either party, either house. He's got guts. Yeah, he's got guts, but uh, he's willing to do that, well, because first he's a man of principle, and he has a very safe seat in Congress from Texas. And uh, the voters in his district will continue to send him back to Washington, but he won't be able to accomplish anything. Now, he, there's always been one man, one congressman in Washington who would oppose the Federal Reserve. During the 1920s, it uh, was a congressman from uh, uh, Pennsylvania who was a banker himself and who was appalled, and his name was uh, Congressman McFadden. And I mentioned him quite a bit in my book. And uh, he died suddenly at a banquet one night, a political banquet, and uh, everybody assumed that he was poisoned because he was a very dangerous opponent. And... Uh, uh, when Eugene Meyer was proposed for a uh, member of the Federal Reserve Board, that's the guy that bought the <laughs> Washington Post, uh, McFadden <laughs> held hearings and showed uh, that Eugene Meyer, who was a partner of Bernard Baruch, uh, had, uh, Baruch was appointed head of the War Industries Board during World War I by Wilson after a $50,000 contribution. 
and which was a lot of money at that time. And uh, his partner, Eugene Meyer, they had the Alaska Juno Gold Mining Company in uh, Alaska, which is, I think, uh, a typical fake mining operation. But uh, his partner was appointed head of the uh, War Finance Corporation. So you had Meyer and Brook running Washington during World War I. And so um, uh, Meyer apparently was a rather creative person. And as head of the War Finance Corporation, he printed Liberty Bonds, which they sold to finance the war. And it was your patriotic duty to buy Liberty Bonds. And Meyer was such a patriot that he thought as long as he was printing them, he would print them in duplicate, one for himself and one to sell to the people. So uh, as head of the War Finance, he printed all the Liberty Bonds in duplicate, and the others he sold on New York through his uh, firms up there. No one knew that they were duplicates, of course, because who's going to check the numbers of Liberty Bonds? <laughs> and so uh, with that money, uh, <clears throat> he, he bought a big uh, chemical company after the war, and then he bought the Washington Post. So the Washington Post was printed with the money which Meyer stole as head of the War Finance Corporation. So uh, Lewis McFadden brought this out during the hearings. And then he complained that when uh, Meyer's uh, assistants were bringing in the books of the War Finance Corporation, this was 1931, and the war, of course, ended in 1918, <clears throat> that uh, when they brought the books in, you could see that uh, most of the pages had been altered. In other words, Meyer's accountants were sitting up all night changing the books before they brought it to McFadden. And of course, this is another criminal endeavor. But uh, there again, uh, McFadden was a lone wolf, and uh, nothing was ever done about it. And uh, Meyer was approved uh, by the Senate as a member of the Federal Reserve Board. And that's all in my book, too. So then after McFadden died, uh, another congressman came along from Texas, and uh, he was from Texarkana. And uh, now I'll have to <laughs> look and remind myself his name. Uh, yeah, Wright Patman, and I used to go to Wright Patman's office, and he had my book right on his desk. And I quoted, from, I, I cited his letter in there from Wright Patman that he had uh, uh, always thought of very highly of my book. But even Wright Patman, as a personal friend, could not, was, was afraid to have me testify at hearings on the Federal Reserve. I was never asked. Here I was. I'd written the book. I had done all the research. I was the authority on the Federal Reserve System. I was never once asked, even by Wright Patman, to testify uh, about pending matters uh, when they were uh, investigating the Federal Reserve Board. Never. <laughs> oh, they, they've had investigations of the uh, Federal Reserve Board <laughs> off and on ever since 1925. But they never amount to anything because, and the press never covers them. But I found all of these books uh, of the congressional investigations in uh, the Library of Congress, never been read or quoted by anybody. So, what's your next step? I mean, obviously, they're incredibly greedy. You know, we, we hear about this talk about, you know, uh, United Nations taxes, and I would think there would be all, you know, the, the Federal Reserve and the other central banks of Europe that are going to, you know, try to put this new scheme together. How do you see that playing out? Well, they're always creating money. They've created the euro in uh, Europe, uh, which is another Federal Reserve dollar with no visible backing of any kind. <clears throat> I think it's in order to cover up the fact that they're creating so much money that they need to keep taxing people and convincing people that no matter what country you're a citizen of, you got to keep paying taxes to these people uh, for all the wonderful services you get. They talk about government services, you know. They're always bringing that up. Well, we would have to cut services. We would have to cut the schools. And they even start closing libraries, you know, just oh, to yeah. convince people. Uh, say, well, we can't have the libraries open at night anymore because uh, we're so short of funds. And the national parks, you know, they charge you to go into national parks. Here, they, every day they're sending billions of dollars overseas to various boondoggles. And the total budget of the 
whole national park system is like $100 million a year. But you hear these cries of desperation. We don't have money to fix the potholes in the parks. We don't have money to keep the campgrounds going. And this is uh, one of the main sources of recreation for the American people are the national parks. And yet they're starving them to death because they feel like if you really want to go to a national park, why can't you pay a fee and go? You know? <laughs> That's their attitude, yes. Of course, you know that the national parks have all been taken over by the United Nations, and they're called biospheres. The park fees have increased dramatically. Oh, yes. The rivers have been taken over from, by the Heritage River Foundation, so we, the rivers aren't ours anymore. The parks aren't ours. The revenue to go into, I mean, the, the, the amount that they charge to go into any place has quadrupled, and then they tell you no more snowmobiles in the national parks. Oh, yes. Because they don't want us running into any nest of the of the foreign troops that are training as we speak. Oh, definitely. So what about your conspiracy on top of conspiracy? I mean, this is a wall that's got to come down sometime. I think more than the tragedy of the money and the way they have stolen from us is the way they have destroyed our children. Oh, yes. Destroyed our children in the wars with their vaccines with their, uh, their chemtrails, everything that they have done to it to destroy our children just makes me live it. Oh, well, Davy Kidd, I was just talking to her here. Yes, she has the table here. She made a com complete investigation of all the school shootings. She found that every child involved in those shootings was on uh, Prozac and Ritalin and other of these uh, mind-altering drugs. So you're right, terrible crimes are being committed against the children, and the parents, uh, you know, what can you do when the government poisons your a child with mind-altering drugs. It's no longer your child anymore. Well, worse than that, you whack your kid in the, in the mall, and the next thing you know, you've got social services showing up to take your children away from you. Oh, yes, yeah, child you're abuse. Damned if you're oh, good, yes. You're damned if you didn't. Oh, that's right. I mean, they, they have all the power. They have power, and as I say, they use force. Oh, yeah. Uh, they can accuse you of child abuse, and you, you look out and there's a car full of uh, sheriffs, deputies, and everybody else there in your car, and you wouldn't dare resist. They'd blow you away just like that. <laughs> mm -hmm. In fact, they, they really like resistance. Right. They'd like for you to come out shooting so they can use their guns, you know. And uh, after all, it's very boring shooting at targets in the firing range of the police all the time. To get out and shoot some real people would be uh, a great change. <laughs> oh, I think fun. and. And, of course, maybe put a notch or two on the barrel, you know. <laughs> what, what do you think is the prognosis? What is our future? Can well, you... the prognosis is the government's going to get worse, and I think the people are going to resist more. I think that's the prognosis. Uh, you have the Internet revolution. Uh, this stuff is suddenly going all over the country instantaneously. I mean, before, uh, people used to print little mimeographed newsletters uh, 50 years ago and hand them out and reach... Uh, a hundred or two hundred people. Now it goes over the country instantaneously. <clears throat> and uh, also by seeing it so instantaneously, it has a more immediate effect. People are more enraged by it. I mean, when you get a newsletter in the mail that someone has mailed two weeks ago, it really doesn't uh, excite you, but you pick something off the internet and my God, it hits you right in the head and you're ready to do something. No, I think the tide is turning against these people. They have abused us. They have abused uh, and ta taken license with everything that they did, like printing the Federal Reserve money, which should never have been allowed in the first place, because the only thing they know to do with their ill-gotten gains is to attack the people, to enslave them more, mm -hmm. hire more police and get more guns. Uh, they take all the guns away from us and we can't protect ourselves. Well, that's what they've been trying to do for years. And they Russia, just haven't had the means to do it. I know, but except the way uh, Russia was, uh, and they couldn't defend themselves, and that, look what happened to them. Oh, yeah, Russia and Germany, they, they took the guns. Yeah. And, uh, no, as long as we still have privately owned guns, our freedom will last that long. The day the guns are gone, we're gone. That's right. Yes. Yeah, and it's happening. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. Well, the big thing, I work in agriculture, and they, 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 the, the international bankers are destroying agriculture in this country. And if you're not, I'm not aware of that, I've studied that very extensively. Oh, yes. We now import half of our food. Sure. Mm -hmm. And the people, if you're concerned about food safety, most of the food that comes in is not inspected. Like less than 2% that comes across the borders is inspected. So be sure if you buy fruits and vegetables that you wash them well, it, you know, because the... 
the uh, the rules are different. With the NAFTA, that's again in the GATT agreements and WTO, uh, they have just absolutely decimated the agriculture, and it's right now direct subsidies to the farmers will be 50 percent of this year's income. My gosh, that's 50 percent. Mm -hmm. And so, guess what? Food control is population is people control. Well, it is because they would rather have your food produced in another country and imported. Not only make a lot of money hauling it here, and they also make a lot of commissions on reselling it, but the food produced in Mexico and Chile and so forth, uh, you see, many dangerous chemicals have been banned in this country, right. but mm -hmm. Monsanto and Dow can send those chemicals to any other country, right. and... Uh, they will produce the bright green lettuce and the big, uh, beautiful grapes, but they're loaded with those chemicals. And uh, we have no way of knowing that. As you say, they come across, they're not inspected. Uh, there's no way that our uh, government agencies could ever inspect foreign uh, uh, farms to see how much of these pesticides they're using. So it was a great uh, boon for the chemical companies after these things were banned here and it reduced their market here. They, they, they're selling even more overseas because over there, uh, uh, the market is unlimited. There's no, they don't have uh, legislatures in those countries that will meet and ban dangerous substances uh, because there, the, the only thing is to make money and survive. And so, uh, no, we're really endangered by the foreign produce coming in this country because uh, it's absolutely loaded with dangerous chemicals. Along, oh, excuse me. Along with that, uh, the the trend is is that with farming going out, we won't be we'll be in a position of surrender. Oh yes. Because we uh, World War II, World War One, mm -hmm. we were we produced our own food and and quite a lot of excess. That's not really true anymore. Yes, we have an excess of a few commodities, but generally speaking, uh, we're we're on a deficit here and. Uh, we're actually importing uh, beans out of Canada now, packaging them in Twin Falls because they can mm. buy them cheaper there because oh. of the exchange rate. Oh, yeah, certainly. And the same way potatoes. And the big corporations come to the growers, potato growers in Idaho where I live, and they extort them and say, well, if you don't take less money for your contract, and they're already basically at below production costs, oh, yeah. even the best growers, and uh, they say, well, we're going to take it to Canada. Well, they're going to take it to Canada and you talk about the Brit the Second Revolutionary War, the British have won it economically. Oh, oh yes. Yeah, Canada right now is, uh, you know, Simplot there in Idaho, the, the great potato man. Yeah. I think they have backed him into a corner. You know, he produces all the potatoes for McDonald's or did. I think I read about a year ago that they were switching to a uh, to Canadian firms. I don't think he has those McDonald contracts anymore. Well, he has some, but, you know, they've, they've cut way back. Oh, and, yeah. And as they're increasing in Canada... Uh, they're just cutting, cutting, uh, cutting us out of the picture, and uh, the only problem they have, uh, fortunately, climate-wise, uh, Idaho has still the ideal climate. Oh them. yes. And uh, some of the other areas that does make some differences when you're growing things, but still they'll try to get around it. And we've taken our technology, our tax money, and and help produce food all around the world. Oh yes. Make it. Mm -hmm. And the overseas, you might uh, comment about the overseas private investment corporation, another misnomer. Oh, it, oh, it certainly you might is. Want to tell people about that. Well, they set up a number of those companies. Uh, Nelson Rockefeller uh, set up one in South America, uh, and it was uh, called the International Overseas uh, Company, I think. But there's a number of them. But uh, Rockefeller set up his in Colombia. Uh, to invest the money that he made supplying the Nazi submarines with gasoline during World War II. Exactly. And uh, Jed Hoover uh, found out that he was doing this, and he goes rushing to Roosevelt. He thought he finally had the Rockefellers. And um, he said, Mr. President, uh, the Rockefellers are, sell are supplying uh, the uh, Germans with uh, uh, their German battleships and submarines all through South America. And uh, so uh, Roosevelt said, well, thank you, Edgar. I'm so glad you brought me this information. <laughs> and he put it in a file. And he already knew it anyway. 
But then Rockefellers had all this money after World War II, and so the, they invested it in these vast enterprises down there. And I think the Columbia drug trade is probably the natural outgrowth of the Rockefeller investments in Columbia. They claimed they were just growing coffee, yeah. but uh, right. drugs are a lot more profitable than coffee, believe me. <laughs> Yes. Then, then you may want to talk about how the how Vietnam the war was extended so they could continue to bring the drugs in and the cad cadavers. So, oh yes. Oh, that was another piece. Oh, that was a tremendous thing. All the bodies of our soldiers uh, killed in Vietnam were brought home stuffed with huge bags of uh, drugs, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then they would open it up and take the drugs out and sell them, and then go ahead and give the boys a, a good decent uh, burial, but. That was just a means of transportation. These these people are so cold-blooded and so ruthless yeah. that the average American cannot envision, cannot begin to envision uh, what they're like. Yes. You mentioned earlier today that um, how they were trying to destroy the American uh, people and make us paupers and everything, but for some reason the economy is is still strong and they haven't ruined it. Do you have any more information on Oh, that? yes. I, I, I mentioned at that time that uh, we simply responded by working harder and being more ingenious, mm -hmm. developing new methods of production. Mm -hmm. So uh, their efforts to destroy us just spurred us on to be more creative. And uh, this prosperity is due almost entirely to the extraordinary pressures brought on by the, uh, by the measures, retaliatory measures, against the American people to uh, tax them more, to be more repressive, to have more government rela uh, regulations, and uh, to narrow our markets. And we responded by making more money than ever. <laughs> so, well, you know, the yes. other thing is, look at the contrails. They dump these millions of tons of chemicals on us every day, and we're still freaking here. We should have been dead years ago. Oh, yeah. Well, we take all these wonderful medications from Rockefeller's drug companies, no, and that's what's keeping us going. <laughs> no, no, when they dump the contrails, we have to rush out and buy millions of dollars worth of uh, medicines just to survive. So, uh, so they win both ways. <laughs> but they will ruin us through agriculture. Agriculture is the way they ruin us because unless you live off of your land, uh, no, con no country can survive without uh, living off their own land. Now, Japan, of course, uh, they don't have any room to grow food in Japan. I have been there many times. Every inch of the uh, land is taken up by homes and factories. Mm -hmm. So you don't have any fields of uh, grain and all that sort of stuff. They have to import it all. But, uh, the, and so the Japanese have to work twice as hard to produce enough money to buy their own food. And uh, the consequence is they're totally under control. I have been ever since the military occupation. We still have 47,000 troops in Japan. So uh, anybody that thinks that Japan is not occupied, mm. I think in 52 or 54, they drafted some sort of agreement that Japan is now fully independent. Well, when you go to Japan, the press is totally controlled. Uh, the television is totally controlled. There's no dissent anywhere in Japan. It's like Soviet Ru Russia was under Stalin. and. Uh, uh, the, the people don't mind this because Japanese are not very uh, argumentative people anyway, and they just accept this, and uh, they go along and work, and uh, they live almost in hovels. The standard of living in Japan is awful. They have these enormous apartment houses were like barracks, and in these huge apartments, they only have like a room and a half for four people. <laughs> it's really terrible. They have no room to park cars. They can't buy cars because there's no place to park a car. <laughs> Only wealthy people in Japan have cars. So uh, that's, that's really why they inundated us and the rest of the world with uh, their cars, because after they produced them in Japan, they couldn't sell them to the Japanese people because uh, there's no place to put them. <laughs> Very few people have a uh, place in uh, Japan to park a car. Well, I think in uh, New York City in Manhattan now, it costs you about the same price as an apartment just to get a parking place. <laughs> and I, when I lived there uh, uh, 50 years ago, it was still rough, but then it got to where you really had to uh, buy a, a parking place in some enclosed garage. And uh, it started at 200 a month, and now it's about 2,000 a month. <laughs>
Yeah. Oh, yes. Oh, the price of a parking place in Manhattan today is about the same as the price of an uh, apartment. You could afford a lot of taxis <laughs> for that. <laughs> well, they could afford taxis. But uh, for some of them, they, they have enough money. And uh, uh, there's the prestige of owning your own automobile. And so they do that. It's just like John Kennedy. He had the prestige of owning his own airplane. But uh, with all of his money, I thought he would have had a pilot. But instead, he insisted on piloting himself. And uh, so uh, he's no longer with us because uh, he and his $150 million fortune crashed. And that was <laughs> the end of that. I yes. You haven't heard the conspiracy. Oh, yes, I've heard all conspiracy theories about Kennedy. Well, I don't think that he crashed. I don't no. think he was incompetent at all. I think he was taken down. Well, uh, the information that they released immediately after the crash was so suspicious. Yeah. Here on the front page of every newspaper are these lurid, very detailed stories of how confused he was and yeah. totally yeah. lost, yeah. Like didn't know he was up or down. <laughs> like they were sitting there with him. Yeah, well, they must have been in the cockpit. How would they have known all these things? Yeah. Uh, uh, but uh, they were very detailed. When you see that kind of uh, manufactured propaganda, and, and it hits the press within hours after any of this stuff, and uh, uh, it's, it's just like uh, Hillary uh, Clinton in her newspaper column when Ron Brown crashed in uh, oh, yeah, Yugoslavia, and in her column the next day she told about the terrible weather, storms, and so forth. Well, in fact, there were no but storms at all. <laughs> but. Uh, that, that doesn't bother them. Uh, they're, they're given this propaganda, and they grind it out, and it appears in all the papers, yes. Remember the big secret operation of bringing up the plane, that they did this whole Kennedy thing with a big boat out there, you couldn't get too close, no, but they wouldn't let any photographers. Oh, no, top secret. Said, oh, he's sitting right in the, you know, his, his head was against the window, and the whole front of it was just, the, the plane was just perfect, and he was just laying there against the window at the bottom of the ocean. But then they show, the, uh, about a week ago, they showed this destroyed plane. It looks like it's absolutely nothing but just a, a bunch of wreck. Oh, yeah. And all of a sudden, it went from here, everything is perfect, they just lose the tail of the thing, yeah, the ice sitting there perfectly dead and beautiful, to this thing has been completely destroyed. And nobody even remembers that that's what we saw last September was all that crap. Well, I have uh, heard from various people that the plane that they finally wound up with wasn't Kennedy's plane at all, <laughs> which is probably true. That's the way they do things. Everything. Yeah, everything. They do it the same way. Well, I have a friend in Martha's Vineyard, and I'll be going there next month, and uh, he sent me a clipping. When the Kennedy uh, crash occurred, the Vineyard Gazette, which one of the two newspapers on uh, Martha's Vineyard, I printed a uh, interview with one of the summer residents, a lawyer from Cincinnati, who said he was out uh, in his yard working, and uh, he saw this plane, and uh, uh, he saw an explosion and heard the explosion. And they printed his complete interview in the Venue Gazette. It was never picked up by any newspaper in the world. Here is an eyewitness to the Kennedy crash. and. Uh, uh, not one paper would touch it, and of course this man, uh, you never heard of him again, whatever happened to him, I don't know. But that was actually printed in the uh, I island saw paper. I an article <laughs> on that. You yeah. saw the article on that? Yeah. Yeah, I've got the interview at home. I've got the complete article from the Vineyard Gazette. He was fishing. Yeah, fishing, and uh, I uh, heard an explosion and looked up and there was this explosion, yes. Did you ever know Congressman Larry McDonald? He was the Ron Paul of his day. No, uh, he was a little before my time. And, well, he was, uh, you know, everybody remembers KAL Flight 007. Oh, oh yes. Uh, September 1st, uh, 1983. Uh -huh. And uh, the first news reports, the newspaper I got on the front said that the plane was down, they were negotiating for the release of hostages at Sacklin Island. Right. I turn on the TV, 30 seconds later, Later, they said that the plane was down, there are no survivors. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and those people all, maybe with the exception of a couple of them, were put into Soviet prisons. In fact, mm -hmm. through the Soviet underground, Larry McDonald was, was seen. Was seen, okay. And uh, I always thought it would be like Capricorn 1, if he could escape. Yeah. yeah. Boy, it would really would have blown things. I prayed for that for a long time. Well, I'm, but, I'm uh, sure they made sure he wouldn't escape. But no, I've heard those stories too about they're all held prisoner. But you see, 
But they can't let them go because it would blow the whole thing. Yeah. It's just like when I was in the Air Force in World War II, uh, we developed a system where the planes could fly from England and bomb Germany, and they didn't have enough gas to return, so they would continue on and land in Russia. Well, all the ones that landed in Russia, uh, our loyal ally Stalin put them in prison camps yeah. because the system in Russia was you could never allow anybody from another country to come into Russia. Uh, if they did, you wouldn't, uh, they were never allowed to leave because they'd tell people what they saw there, how horrible the conditions were and how unpopular the government was. And so they were all in prison and never heard from again. Not one word from our military commanders who knew that the crews were being imprisoned in Soviet camps. And to this day, not one of them ever opened their mouth about it. How about Operation Keel Hall? Oh, Keel Hall was the most tragic thing of all. And uh, there was a... Um, uh, he was, I think, a Hungarian Jew, and he became, he, uh, became a, a fish, an officer in the British Army. And he was one of the principal overseers of that. I think his name was Lowe. And uh, so years later, the story was uh, published in England about how he oversaw Operation Kill Hall, and, um, which was all true. But he sued for libel and got an enormous judgment against the people who said this. Well, <laughs> you know, it was all true. Kiel. What, what is that? Uh, well, you see, a lot of Russians were so relieved when the German army came into Russia. After all, they'd been living under a terrible dictatorship. And so they immediately, uh, the, the soldiers surrendered without fighting. And uh, so uh, they agreed to join, instead of becoming prisoners, they agreed to join the German army and become a large force of the German army, which they did. And they were uh, led by General Vlaskov, uh, who became one of the uh, biggest division commanders of the German army. So, of course, when uh, the war ended uh, and they all surrendered, uh, the Vlaskov Legion, as it was called, all of the former Russian soldiers were segregated and uh, were turned over to, to the uh, Soviet authorities. And... Uh, Many of them knew what was going to happen, and they tried to commit suicide. They had many no weapons. Did. Well, yeah, well they, they did what? They did commit many of them. Oh, many of them did commit suicide, even though the weapons had been confiscated. They stabbed themselves. They did all sorts of things, and uh, sometimes they didn't have the weapons, and uh, so it was only a partial thing, and they were all dragged away uh, to, to the Soviet Union. Of course, they were all killed. This was under the direction of Dwight David Eisenhower. Oh, Eisenhower agreed, yes, that these, these traitors should be returned to Russia, to our loyal allies. No, it was one of the great atrocities of World War II. Today it's almost entirely forgotten. There were books published about it. There were three books published about it, Op Operation Keel Hall. And the story came out again later when uh, Harold Macmillan became Prime Minister of Great Britain. And he was the British officer in charge of this whole thing. And um, so uh, I think that he uh, employed the standard excuse. He was merely following orders. <laughs> well, actually, Eisenhower, had, who, of course, was his superior, had approved the turning over of the prisoners to Soviet Union. And uh, they were all killed. Well, there's something uh, very nasty. Some, another thing that happened with Eisenhower, and that's that he had these big camps set up when they took all the German soldiers that were left over from the war put them in the camps where they died with no food, no no protection from the elements, and no medicine, and they just died in heaps in these big open prisons with, I mean, supposedly these were prisoners of war. Oh, yes, yeah. Geneva Convention. Yeah, so they just <coughs> left them there to die by the thousands, oh, by this, the millions. There's a book out of that that yeah, was written by a Canadian. Other Losses. Oh, yeah, uh, Other Losses. Yeah, that's a good book. Six to your stomach. Yeah, and uh, the guy who wrote this was not pro-German or anything. Uh, he just heard about it and st started looking into it, and he was appalled. He went ahead and wrote the book. And, of course, it had a very small sale because uh, it was uh, dismissed as uh, pro-Nazi propaganda. <laughs> and even Senator Joe McCarthy, uh, who tried to defend some of the people who were being arrested and tortured in Germany, these s soldiers, 
because uh, many of them had relatives in Milwaukee, which was his district. He represented Wisconsin. And um, so he went on the uh, uh, floor of the Senate and described some of the personal stories that these relatives told him about how these men were being tortured. And uh, he was immediately denounced as a Nazi apologist. <laughs> oh, yeah. And I think that was one of, that was the beginning of the turning of the tide against Joe McCarthy. With that initial condemnation as a Nazi sympathizer, uh, it was all downhill from there. Yeah. Would you care to comment about uh, the power structure and how they, they line people up once they get in the system so they don't get out? In other words, you, you're rewarded as long as you play the game. Oh, right. There was a movie called The Brotherhood of the Bell with Glenn. Oh, I remember that movie, well, which is yeah. never shown on television today. Uh, never. <laughs> you'll never see it and you won't find it. Well, actually, it was a privately, I, I thought it was a commercially made movie, but it wasn't. It was a made-for-movie TV uh -huh. uh, thing. and. You won't find it now. They're just the copies that are taken off the TV. What, uh, what's the name of it? Brotherhood of the Bell. Bell? Yeah, Brotherhood of the Bell. Now, you think you can buy any movie in this country that you want to see. You've got thousands of video stores, but you cannot buy that movie. Uh, I know Glenn Ford's son, Peter Ford, who has a uh, talk show in Hollywood. And um, so Peter was going to have me on his talk show, and people warned him I was too controversial, so he never did that. <laughs> He's friendly to me, but he never has had me on his show. Art Bell did the same thing. So a lot of these show, uh, talk show hosts, uh, when they hear that I'm going to be on, they come under so much pressure. Yeah. And uh, they tell them, well, it's your program, or Eustace, which do you want? <laughs> so so they choose the program. <laughs> and they have, that's the only choice they've got, yes. Tell us about Waco. Oh, Waco was a uh, training exercise for the Army, actually, and Koresh was set up all the way. Uh, I think what happened was they stored some weapons there under some pretext or other, and he said, sure, i got plenty of room, put them down there. Maybe they paid him, they probably, maybe they paid him 300 a month or something for storage. So uh, and then they, they set up this thing that they were going to uh, uh, raid him for these weapons, you know. It was part of the gun grab. Uh, lobby is what it was. The, the weapons were stolen by the Mossad. Were stolen by the Mossad from the armories all across the United States. Oh, that's what they were. And then he he said that if you don't keep paying me, I might have to mention where these weapons came from. Oh yes, and uh -huh. that's when they lowered the boom. Oh sure. <laughs> uh -huh. So it was a Mossad op. Well, I knew all along that Waco was a Mossad operation, but I didn't realize they were uh, Mossad's weapons. The weapons were from where? Stolen from the armories all across the United States. By Israeli intelligence, Mossad. Oh. That's the that's the arm of the. Uh, that was the beginning of. Yeah, there's a book exposing Mossad called "By Way of Deception" by one of their former agents, and they claim to have a million dollar. He lived in Canada, and uh, so L. T. Patterson, whom I wrote for, was going to have him come and speak at a meeting there that I was speaking at, and um, so they told him in Canada that uh, if he left Canada, that he would not be allowed back. So he'd be stuck in the United States or go somewhere else. So he, did, he never came to the meeting. And they claimed the Mossad had a million dollar contract on him. He's never uh, been harmed. And he's made quite a lot of money out of his book, which has gone through several editions. So uh, yeah, I heard him lecture finally. He came to Washington and lectured. And uh, it was a pretty standard story. His training as a Mossad agent and how they're trained to be totally ruthless. and. When they're told to kill somebody, they have to kill them, and they do. Uh, they're, they're really all assassins. They're trained as assassins. They don't always uh, assassinate people, but that's part of their duties. If they're asked to do it, they have to do it. And uh, yeah, Mossad is considered the most feared intelligence organization in the world. Uh, what do you know about uh, Oklahoma City? Well, uh, I was quoted on the editorial page of the New York Times after that that uh, the Oklahoma City bombing was a standard government operation. Mm -hmm. They quoted me and then never denied it. Uh, what I said, you would say, think that they would follow that up and by saying, well, this is typical of Eustace Mullins or something like that. They didn't. They just printed my statement and uh, with no comment. And then uh, Red Beckman, a friend of mine from Montana, he was interviewed about it immediately. And uh, so uh, the Wall Street Journal interviewed him, and they quoted him on the front page. Uh, uh, he said, well, anyone who know, who's familiar 
with this kind of thing knows that it's a government operation. And um, so they printed uh, Red Story, and the New York Times printed mine, and there were other comments, and of course I talked about it on talk shows. And uh, as I say, no one ever challenged these statements at all to this day. Because <laughs> the sheep are stupid, and they don't even, they're not paying attention. If you think the government operation, they'll think, yeah, the government cleaned the books. Yeah, what I meant was a, a total oh, standard managed government operation, the way they do everything. Right. And uh, no, Oklahoma City was necessary because uh, the terrorism bill was stalled and they had to get it through. Exactly. So, passed two days later. Yeah, passed two days later. Yeah, because that was, it was absolutely stalled in Congress. Right. Nobody in Congress cared about the terrorism bill. There was right. no reason for it. And so they had to engineer this and uh, they did it. And uh, they've done so many things like that. And uh, well, there were people in Oklahoma City who had families that were victimized by this, uh, uh, by this monster, Timothy McVeigh, you know. Oh, yeah, he's a <laughs> Oh, well, they demonize you, you know. Oh, I know, he's got a chip and he doesn't even have a clue what happened. Yeah. And all he did was drive around without a plate on his car, and the next thing you know, he's going to be slammer charged with all this well, crap. Well, that becomes a capital offense, apparently. Oh, yeah. But, uh, no, uh, th these things happen like this, and, uh, yeah. uh, well, they demonize people. You see, after the Waco, Holo I call it the Waco Holocaust, what? And, uh, oh, I'm always, uh, uh, they always say, Eustace Mullins insists on calling it the Waco Holocaust. It makes them furious, but uh, they can't do anything about it. And it is a Holocaust. So, uh, uh, see, the, their contention is there's only one Holocaust, the one in Germany, and you're not allowed to use that anywhere else. Well, I use it wherever they massacre women and children, which they did at uh, Waco. And so, uh, <clears throat> this. I point out that uh, even the Nazis, as far as I know, never herded an entire Christian congregation into the church and burned them alive, yeah. and uh, which happened at Waco. Yeah. So, uh, but you know, not a so-called Christian minister in the United States really would open their mouth about Waco. It's yeah. the you know, strangest thing. You would have thought there had been one independent minister somewhere that would say, well, look, uh, we shouldn't be burning congregations alive in their churches because after all that guy has a congregation also maybe he would be next who knows so but they let that pass without a comment oh all the tax credit oh yes go ahead we'll take a pause for tape chains what? You know, all this has been uh, one of Bill Clinton's mentors, uh, Tragedy and Hope, the book uh, might be good. Oh, Carol Quigley? Yeah, Carol I, Quigley. I know the book, yeah. Yeah, you know, and uh, it wasn't that they come out with a second edition. You might want to comment about it, because he just spilled the whole beans of what the whole game plan was. Well, he, he did. was Bill Clinton's mentor. Oh, he certainly was. And, in fact, Bill Clinton mentioned him in his, what, exception speech, I think it was. I believe it. Oh, he did, yes. Yeah. He certainly did. And, uh, and well, I spoke I up at Twin, the, the radio talk show that I told you that was canceled on me, that was the Twin Balls. It was a young guy. Oh, during, really? That was in 92 during so the, uh, uh -huh. yeah. Well, his, his boss and a bunch of women, I mean, they're real weenies. Well, this guy was green. I mean, he was a kid. He sounded like he was about 20 years old. Yeah. For maybe he's, been a, he's gone to St. George, Utah, but I don't have so Oh, oh you know him. about him then, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, he cut me off. I was on his program. Oh, okay. I was on his program. Well, no. Uh, he, and the only reason he cut him off was because I'm sure he wouldn't have cut you off. No, no. Somebody you. told him, stop sure. this guy right now. Yeah. No, I, he may not even pull the switch. It could have been somebody else. So they've, could, cut, they've cut all. they cut all the talk, talk shows off in that station now. Oh, well, talk shows have been cut cut down everywhere, but people start new ones, you know. Because see, they were they're getting under pressure to get relicensed. Oh, oh yes. Oh, they yeah. They hold that record over there. Oh, they, they got, got a lot. They yeah, absolutely. They have, the, you know, they got four four radio stations there in the Magic Valley and could do so much good. They have one hour left to oh, talk radio. My, one hour, that's one awful. One hour left. That's so all see, they've got. And see, I get on there whenever I get a chance. See, Tom Donahue came up there in, uh, I think, about 1988 and started a talk program, and he did real well. 
He was under a lot of restrictions uh, because the present senator at that time from Idaho, Tom interviewed him and he tried to have Tom taken off the air. He retired himself not long after that. Well, they very All right, yes. All right, we'll resume our meeting now. We haven't got too much time left, so we will uh, continue our question program, and uh, we'll get ready for the grand wind-up here. So, uh, so I have a question over here. All right. This is a two-part question. Uh, most of it's a smoke screen. All, nearly all of these tax uh, projections are uh, disinformation or smoke screen because uh, they're really wallowing in such a surplus of money right now that they couldn't possibly use any more taxes. But that's the last thing they want to tell you because the minute they mention that, uh, everybody's going to quit paying. And so uh, they have to continue this illusion that the government is depending on your money and uh, if they don't continue to get these taxes from you, everything's going to shut down, uh, everything will close, the libraries, the schools, there will be no police on the street, no fire departments. You know, they, they, they conjure up these uh, horror stories and people panic. Oh, well, what are we going to do? No fire department? The house will burn down? And uh, uh, of course, there's absolutely no likelihood of any of this, but uh, they got people so brainwashed that anything that these people say, no matter how ridiculous it is, uh, it has its immediate effect. During the uh, Reagan election um, in 1980, uh, there was a lady, she was a, a relative, and uh, she was a widow, and she was very comfortably off, and uh, she almost had a total nervous breakdown because the Democrats claimed that if Reagan was elected, <laughs> he would shut down Social Security. There'd be no, and this poor lady, she was about 70 years old, and uh, she simply almost went into total collapse at the horrible prospect. And here she was actually very well cushioned. She had a nice home, steady income, and uh, <coughs> most of her Social Security checks she put in the bank to give to her grandchildren later on as part of her estate. But it was just the, uh, she, she just was so troubled by this that uh, she just totally went into collapse. <laughs> And this way people are so conditioned that they think that all of these myths that the government uh, turns out, and of course the government went into public relations in a big way during the 1930s under the Roosevelt administration. Uh, you know, Herbert Hoover didn't even have a telephone in the White House, and uh, they, I don't think they ever thought of anybody doing public relations for government agencies at that time. This all came about uh, during the 1930s. And once you set up a public relations department, it grows. You start off with one person, then they hire a secretary, then they hire a couple more people. Uh, I had a friend who worked in public relations at uh, the Department of Commerce. And I think before you knew it, they had a department of about 30 or 40 people. <laughs> Mostly with nothing to do, but that's fine too, you know. <laughs> Get paid and not do any work. Uh, yes? Um, I was wondering if uh, you could give us your take on the uh, constitutional aspect of the Federal Reserve. You didn't really address it today. No, I didn't get into that because that's been talked about so much before. And, of course, Article 1, Section 8 specifically designates that Congress shall have the power to coin money and to regulate weights and measures, all of which have now been taken over by other agencies. And uh, because uh, Congress had this power, uh, they really did not have the authority to delegate it to a private bank because that abrogated the Constitution. And of course, the Federal Reserve Act of 1913 did not repeal any part of the Constitution. That wasn't part of it. And, um, uh, but it did uh, give a delegated, congr a congressional power was delegated to a private agency, which ordinarily, when that is done, there have to be special provisions made, special licenses, and uh, that they be held to a strict standard of performance. Well, the Federal Reserve Act of uh, 1913 
gave the Federal Reserve Board total uh, control, no restrictions. The only restriction was they couldn't buy or sell the stock because they didn't want anybody to buy it anyway. And uh, they included in the Federal Reserve Act of 1913 that all, uh, all money printed by the Federal Reserve, all bonds issued, would be obligations of the U.S. government. Well, that meant the U.S. government taxpayers because the U.S. government, of course, had no money. So what they did, they saddled the uh, taxpayers with this enormous burden of uh, picking up the bill for all this money that the Board of Governors wanted to print. And we've been stuck with it ever since. Yes? And the fact is that the Federal Reserve has never been audited. Uh, no, Congressman Gonzalez really went after him to be audited. And the reason that uh, they wanted an audit was as a sop to the public uh, in the original Federal Reserve Act of uh, 1913, they included a provision that these selfless bankers who were going to run the Federal Reserve System really didn't want any money. So all the profits, because of course the profits would be enormous from printing your own money, and uh, that all of the profits after expenses, uh, with the exception of 6%, would be turned over to the Treasury. Well, the Treasury has been waiting since 1913. Uh, whether they received any money or not, someone uh, apparently some token sums have been paid. But uh, Gonzalez said, well, let's see if they're fulfilling this commitment, which was part of the original act. And if they're not fulfilling it, they could shut down the whole thing. So uh, every effort to uh, audit the Federal Reserve, uh, the bill going through Congress, I think at one time it got up to 75 congressmen. Uh, got up to 45 one time and it hung on and got up to 50 and hung on and I think finally got up to 70 and that it stopped there. It never, never went any further. So of course it was never passed. And uh, so it remains audit. Well, the, the Federal Reserve Banks, which of course are 12 different banks and they are businesses and uh, they are audited by Price Waterhouse and people like that. Right. Uh, but that's standard business audit, you know, with the, the your standard uh, income and uh, outgo and so forth. But apparently there's never any reporting of this supposed money paid to the U.S. Treasury. And the U.S. Treasury has never complained about it. Uh, they've never said, well, look, we should be getting more than this pittance, you know, and uh, of all this uh, big trillion dollar operation. Yes? The other thing that happened was before the IRS went into business, and all these big corporations took out their foundations, which were all going to be tax exempt. So these wheeler dealers that own everything have never paid a single penny in taxes. Oh, absolutely not. John, Doc John, John D. Rockefeller led the way with the Rockefeller Foundation. Everybody got in back. Uh, the annual book of foundations is an enormous <laughs> book. It's this thick. You couldn't wade through it. Every family that's got a little business in the United States has a uh, foundation. And of course, all it is is tax evasion, mm -hmm. and they generally hire some members of the family to run it, you know, and uh, it's a place where unemployable people can get a job. That's <laughs> and uh, <laughs> uh, they're hired to do nothing, which is a very pleasant life uh, for them, and they run this foundation, and uh, so every year they'll make a few small grants to some disabled students or something like that. And they get tremendous publicity about this. It'd be six or eight thousand dollars or something like that. And uh, so you would think it's John D. Rockefeller all over again, but uh, uh, it's a tremendous charade. It should be closed down because there's no question that the original uh, idea of foundations, which was to protect the the uh, money of the very rich, that sh should be extended to to small businesses throughout the United States, but. Uh, uh, they let them get away with it because this all provides employment. You have to have lawyers draw up the charter of the foundations. Everybody gets paid, and uh, everybody's happy with the results. <laughs> Are we ever going to get our pound of flesh? Oh, we need it. We've certainly got to get our pound of flesh, yes. Because oh, wow. we've, we've, uh, we've had to endure this for so long. Because I really think that when they set up the original Federal Reserve in 1913, 
that they probably figured they could only get away with it for 25 or 30 years. <laughs> and so they would clean up during that time and make enough that it would make it worthwhile. But I don't think they had any idea that we would sit back and, and put up with this for uh, uh, 70 years. Yes? Um, I'm going to play devil's advocate and put them as possible. All right. You uh, the Federal Reserve status as a, a primary instigator and war profiteer and the trust in the band in extending any armed conflict. You get to World War One, World War II, and then the, the, the more recent one, Korea, Vietnam. Now, how does that square with the brevity of the Gulf War? Well, uh, the Gulf War had to be uh, brief because Saddam had, didn't have much of an army. And what it really was was a testing ground for all of our latest military smart bombs and so forth. It later came out that I think the Scud and the Patriot missiles never really worked at all. But uh, during the heady days of the war, there were all these wonderful stories about their triumphs. And I think then about six or eight years later, they admitted that most of them didn't go off, or all of them didn't go off, I don't know. But um, no, it, it was just a grand campaign. Everybody had a wonderful time, except that uh, Schwarzkopf and Colin Powell were amazed that uh, having this great victory, they didn't go in and knock off Saddam Hussein, because uh, they, of course, didn't know that Saddam Hussein was George Bush's partner in a lot of enterprises, Harkin oil and so forth. And uh, in fact, Saddam was partners in a lot of things. Uh, uh, he owns part of the Hachette Corporation, a media conglomerate in France, which put up $25 million for uh, John F. Uh, K. Jr.'s magazine, George. Because, you know, no wealthy person is dumb enough to put his own uh, money at risk in a publication. They get it from somebody else. And I, I think there was some... Uh, political advantage for Hachette to make this investment in the magazine because the magazine itself was a farce from the time it started. It was never serious. I mean, they had this silly picture of George Washington on the cover. And so, um, and uh, I think Jeff Kane Jr. was happy. He uh, had some purpose in life. Uh, you know, he was in his 30s and ne never had really had a job. So uh, uh, this would make being a publisher, you're taken very seriously, and uh, so uh, this gave him instant status in uh, New York, and uh, everything went along very well. And the magazine is a total joke, always has been, but uh, still, after uh, he was killed, they uh, decided to keep it going. I guess enough people are making enough money out of running it that they didn't want to give it up. So it's just kind of coasting along, because in New York, you have this enormous advertising industry, and I think they had enough long-term advertising commitments that it would probably just go on for years. <laughs> yes? Um, <coughs> you say we have this surplus of money. Oh, definitely, yes. Oh, yes. Where is it, and is it real money? Yes. Well, it's, it's real money, and it's, uh, uh, well, it's parked <coughs> under various... Uh, uh, headings. I think a lot of it is parked under unfunded obligations and things like that, so that if you were uh, going through the books, uh, you would never uh, realize that this is a surplus. But uh, there has to be bookkeeping, and it all has to be accounted for, so I'm sure it is. But uh, as long as it's, uh, you know, uh, with fake headings, uh, they never have to let the people know that it's there. And that's my personal opinion about it, that I know that that kind of money uh, would make a dent even in Washington, but uh, it can also be uh, guy in, in disguise so that uh, nobody's going to call it a surplus. I was going to answer her question. That every, every bond issue that's ever been floated in this country for a municipality or a water board or anything is where those initial funds came from. Then they were invested and kept in, the, in that corporation. So, for instance, the water district of Babylon, New York, could pay the national debt just by itself if it's 15 trillion bucks. Yeah, that's been exposed yeah. lately. There was a that's comprehensive, exactly right. the comprehensive financial statements of sure. the municipalities. Uh, gives these figures, but nobody ever sees them. And one guy went around and started checking on them, and he found out these little towns had 40, 50, 100 million dollars, and uh, 
which uh, they're just sitting on, and uh, everybody has an interest in maintaining the status quo, never letting the people know <coughs> that uh, uh, they don't need to pay their water bills anymore. They've got enough money in the water department for the next hundred years. So uh, the idea is to keep people mailing in those checks every month and everything to go along as usual, and the money just keeps piling up. <laughs> yes? Do you still have gold in Fort Knox? Uh, well, I had a friend named Edward Durrell who spent a lot of money uh, tracing that, and uh, he everything that he found was that the money was long gone. Apparently, most of it shipped to Switzerland, some in the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. It was disposed of. Uh, it's like the Tsar's gold in Russia after the Russian Revolution. Most of that was shipped to New York uh, to the offices of Kuhn Loeb Company and uh, Lazard Frere, which was Eugene Myers. Uh, home company. Uh, that was Paris, France, and New York. And uh, Lazard Frères uh, was specialized in gold movements, so they would have moved most of that gold. And uh, <clears throat> the people who do this sort of thing, they're very well versed. They know exactly how to do it. Move it from one country to another. And uh, there's no newspaper accounts, no reportage uh, uh, about it, because the reporters have no interest in gold movements. They w wouldn't have, there's no story there. So uh, it's un totally unreported. You haven't commented about how the changes from a gold-based economy to the to this fiat money that we now carry. It's getting worse all the time. Well, it was done gradually, you see. When the Federal Reserve Act of 1913 pass, was passed, uh, the uh, currency was based on uh, a gold standard. And they began to dilute that and dilute that. Finally, the gold went, and uh, it, it went to silver, and uh, the, then the silver was gotten rid of. But in 1944, I have it in the book here, is when they passed the uh, uh, last restriction uh, that uh, there should be any precious metal behind the currency. Since 1944, it's been paper money issued against paper bonds. No metal of any kind. And that was done during the war, of course, when no one noticed it, because uh, if you were a good patriot, you wouldn't uh, quibble about things like that anyway. We wanted to uh, slap the Jap and stun the Hun, and until uh, <laughs> we got that done, why, you couldn't talk about the backing of the Federal Reserve Bill. Now, a lot of this propaganda, the wars also are very useful. Like I say, you have martial law, oh, yeah. and uh, of course, I was in the service, so I didn't know, but I understand on the home front that uh, uh, there was a lot going on. People were spying on each other and turning, each, turning their neighbors in because they had an extra pound of butter and so forth. And a lot of really vicious stuff going on, and which I can well. And of course, the, the mafia got into rationing in a big way and started manufacturing uh, uh, sugar ration coupons because you see the bootleggers needed it for their whiskey operations, so they couldn't go to, through rationing to, to run a whiskey operation. So the mafia decided to fill the bill, and of course the stamps, I still have some, they were little flimsy green things, you know, that anybody could print in their basement. So the mafia printed a lot of them, billions of dollars worth, and sold them all at a good price. <coughs> and people gladly paid them because they needed the sugar to keep their business going. And it was the same way with meat rationing and everything else. It was all, uh, uh, I think the mafia got into all that eventually because uh, it was a wonderful way to make money, yes. <laughs> Do you, uh, uh, I, I, I keep reading the fact that our world, I mean, the stock market's in tremendous gyration, three, four, five hundred points down and up the next day, that the Fed is losing control, so to speak, and that we will eventually just have a, another super crash. Uh, do you see that in the future? No, no, the Federal Reserve is not losing control at all. That's, uh, as I pointed out, uh, the Federal Reserve Act was passed for speculators because they did not have enough ready cash to engage in the kind of speculations which would engender the profits that they wanted. So by giving us an elastic currency in the Federal Reserve Act, which Paul Warburg stated, was the purpose of the act was to give us an elastic currency. Well, an elastic currency, you all know what that's, that's the term rubber check. Rubber check. Uh, 
uh, describes what they want to do. And they did it. They made it elastic. And once they had an elastic currency, then uh, they could all speculate like crazy and make billions of dollars, and they've been doing it ever since. So the idea that the Federal Reserve is losing control of any of this, I don't think they're losing any control because the speculators are in charge and they're running it for their own benefit and uh, running the market up and down every day. And are they generates doing it because they're so greedy that they, they, they run it? run it up and then pull the profits and then run it back up again. And of course, those yeah. on the inside know what's going to happen. Oh, they, they, make the big profits. they so push it up and down because like, uh, they make money both ways. You yeah. know, you have short selling, sure. so you make money on the way down, mm -hmm. and then you buy it back and you make money on the way back. Mm -hmm. So uh, they're making money both ways and they're just going to keep on doing it. Uh, and then they have all these other things called warrants and options and various things. And these are all traded. And uh, they're making money off of those. No, they've got a very good thing. And that's why uh, the market has generated uh, what Greenspan calls the wealth factor. Uh, these are all money-generating operations, and they just keep on. Uh, I have a friend who remodels houses up in uh, New York State in Connecticut. And uh, he has a perfectly ordinary guy whom you'd never heard of, but he's in the market uh, on Wall Street. And uh, he's spending five million dollars to renovate an old farmhouse. <laughs> five million dollars. And people uh, to renovate an old farmhouse. And people are doing this all in that area that uh, with their market profits, they're, they're uh, buying country estates and uh, just pour, building big swimming pools and stables. And uh, uh, because they have so much money that a, a perfectly ordinary person could put five or ten million dollars into a house because they've, they've made hundreds of millions with all these uh, things that have been going on. And so uh, it really was this sort of thing that uh, Greenspan was trying to discourage, but all he did was to, to hurt the small investor because the small investor has been tremendously hurt by uh, these market uh, operations. That's probably the reason, you, you probably hit on the reason, they hate the small people. Oh, always, and yeah. So they hate us kind of people, the common so-called useless eaters of the world. Oh, useless eaters, yeah. And uh, so in that case, uh, that really made, I mean, you just really hit the nail on the head there, I think, because they run that thing up and down, they, they're going to keep getting wealthier and we're going to, Play the market and day traders and guys are committing suicide. Oh, the day traders, the day traders are all losing money. And uh, well, as I say, I heard Louis Rukeyser state right on Wall Street Week. He said, "Well, the only reason they're doing this is because the big boys don't like to see the little guys getting too much money." Mm -hmm. And I was it's so true. Shocked when I saw him say that, I almost fell off my chair. I never thought he would do that. I thought he was part of the control. Well, he is pretty much part of the control. He's been uh, on television longer than any other financial analyst. But I think, I guess he was just fed up. This whole Greenspan operation was so ridiculous to anybody who knows anything about Wall Street, this uh, uh, delusions of inflation. And uh, it was all just a money-making operation, and that's what it's done. And Rue Kaiser finally decided to uh, say something about it. But, uh, yeah, I never thought he would say it either, but... Uh, uh, you know, he's, he's in charge of his program, and he's very secure, and uh, I don't think he had any repercussions at all. <laughs> what he said was actually very logical. Uh -huh. Yes, the gentleman blue. Uh, that's your blue shirt. Um, yeah. Okay, so the Fed's obviously not living in control, but isn't it also true that they do have a chink in their armor, and that chink is one word, the confidence, like 1920s Weimar Germany, 1980s Brazil. If, if faith and incompetence in a currency is lost, wouldn't that central bank then, by default, lose control? Well, no, uh, uh, there's no confidence in them now. Milton Friedman, but the best known economist in the United States, has stated on the editorial page of the Wall Street Journal a number of times that uh, everything that's happened in the market since the Federal Reserve Act was passed was the fault of the Federal Reserve. And uh, he, he states that very bluntly. Yeah, but that's Milton Friedman. That's Milton Friedman, yeah. <laughs> and he thinks a dollar bill is worth, yes, yeah, a dollar bill is worth a dollar. Yeah. I have every bit of confidence that tomorrow is going to be worth a dollar. <laughs> yes. You know what I mean? Not, not to be argued. Oh, I understand that. But uh, when you say confidence in the uh, Federal Reserve System, uh, I don't think the average investor 
has any confidence in the Federal Reserve System. They don't even realize it's running everything. <laughs> no, mo most investors have never heard of it. confidence by default, wouldn't it? Well, <laughs> yeah. They, they don't know what else to think, so yeah. obviously they've got to be confident. Well, most small investors have probably never heard of the Open Market Committee, so they don't even know what's going on. <laughs> No, it's only the big, really big boys that know about the open market and what the Federal Reserve is really doing. Uh, most small investors, uh, they buy some stocks, they hope to have a little income, uh, make a modest gain and so forth, but uh, they have no concept of how this whole system works or how it's, run, how it's manipulated by uh, the elite. The backing of the currency, isn't it the full faith and credit of the American people? In other words, of our brow. Oh, it is indeed. Uh, we're totally responsible for all this money, and as the Act says, uh, we're totally responsible for it. You can bet that John D. Rockefeller is not worried about the value of the dollar. <laughs> uh, they, they've got things under control, yes. What do you think the plan is for the socialist society in, in uh -huh. worldwide? Uh, socialist society? Cashless society. Oh, cashless society. Well, we're pretty much on a cashless society now. There's the, uh, I think the amount of money in circulation has uh, diminished again mm -hmm. because, you see, you have American Express is printing almost as much money as the uh, Federal Reserve System, and you've got s so many other things, coupons, <coughs> all sorts of negotiable instruments, and uh, money is a medium of exchange, and whatever you've got, if you can exchange it for something, then it's money, <laughs> regardless of who prints it or whose name is on it or anything else. But uh, the money business grows because the economy is growing, and as the economy grows, you need more medium of exchange. So they use travelers' checks, they use everything. So uh, I think that will continue. I think that there will be more cashless society in, in the future because you'll have more electronic transfers of money. I was surprised that uh, my uh, banks in my local town, I think I can transfer money from one bank to another electronically. They don't do it. It's uh, the small town banks are still, but I think the big banks in New York do it all the time. They transfer a million dollars uh, electronically, but uh, the small banks are just not set up to do that. Of course, I never asked them to transfer a million dollars. I would ask them to transfer a thousand, maybe. But they said we can't do it electronically. Yes. So do you think the Fed's going to continue to bump interest rates, or do they have their man position now where they want them being pushed to win the election? Or well, the general consensus uh, that they're printing in the Wall Street Journal and other places is that they have achieved their objectives and that they don't need this other five rate increases. And of course, they're playing with fire because they could always trigger a real crash because there again is the confidence factor. Uh, when people get scared, they get scared, and it's a mass, uh, a mass uh, phenomenon. So they don't want to trigger that. Uh, they would love t to maybe put in one or two small increases and just make a little extra money, but uh, they can get by without it, and I think they will. The what? Oh, the energy prices are an essential part of it. That's, uh, that's uh, part of the double whammy. They put the squeeze on you three or four ways. They raise food prices, they raise energy prices, uh, they raise the interest rate. And uh, the purpose of all of this is more money. That's the only purpose it is, is to charge you more for uh, the goods that you buy, yes. Well, that consumer price index, that's a real fraud because oh, they yes. don't even include food and the medical is part, part of the, the fees, and, and most of us are, our medical insurance is going up 15, 20, 30 percent a year. Oh, yes. And uh, that, that's not even included, so they don't have to pay as much Social Security when it's only 1.3 percent inflation, when it's probably closer to 6 or 7 or 10. Oh, that's true, yes. And no, the CPI has been criticized for years as it's totally out of touch with reality. Yeah. But the government relies on it, and Wall Street relies on it, so they'll continue right. to use it. The Social Security, the, the, the retired people, are, <coughs> you know, they see things going up. The farmers are not getting, they're, they're getting two cents for new potatoes digging right now, and they're 25 cents a pound in the store. Oh, yes. And, and they're so that they can give away the raw commodities, literally, and, and it wouldn't make any difference as far as the prices in the store. Oh, that's absolutely true, yes.
That's all locked in, yes. Could you explain more about NARFED? Oh, NARFED? Yeah. Well, I don't want to get into NARFED too much because here we're talking about the Federal Reserve. And there, there is much to say about NARFED. It's kept that they are trying to provide a new and different currency to uh, the American people. And it's perfectly uh, legitimate. And uh, if more people use it and exchange it for goods and services, uh, uh, they've had other plans like that. In Ithaca, New York, uh, the, they instituted this plan about 25 years ago that in that area uh, they would print money and exchange it <coughs> for local goods and services, and all the merchants used it, and uh, they paid their bills with it. And uh, so it's, it's been very satisfactory. Any of these plans will work as long as it's accepted in that area. But then to go beyond that area, you've got to educate people in other areas that it is a legitimate medium of exchange. And of course, that takes some doing, it takes some time. Okay, so it's a local area. Yeah, local areas, that's uh, the way they do it. Uh, yes? Um, this afternoon, earlier, when we were in the other room, you, you seemed pretty optimistic that the American people would be able to overcome <coughs> this power grab that's been going on for so long. And I was just wanting to be more specific as to why we should be optimistic. I mean, it seems like they're pretty entrenched. Um, and 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 maybe maybe if you could be specific as to as to how you think this whole thing's going to break up and when. Well, <clears throat> I'm optimistic because I pointed out that in the face of everything the government and the corporations have done to prevent this prosperity that we have at the present time, what they call the new economy, that uh, the people have just dug in and worked harder and produced more. And I think that uh, overall, it's amazing that we've survived it all. I think that's optimism in itself. And that we could even have a meeting like this because uh, you can bet that the, uh, the elitists would rather not see any meetings like this, but they go on and uh, uh, people get together and exchange ideas and talk about the future. But as far as specific point by point, I don't have anything at the moment. Well, do you, do you think that, that we will ever depose these people? Oh, I think so. Think? Maybe by attrition, because as they get older and richer and more incompetent, uh, uh, you see the younger generation, what they call the present generation of Rockefellers, uh, has shown practically no interest in taking an active role in power. Uh, David Rockefeller is almost the last of the line. And uh, his brother Lawrence is still a director of National Geographic and Reader's Digest, the two largest magazines in the United States. So they're keeping their hand in, but uh, the direct personal control is kind of passing out of these families, mostly due to the fact that the younger generations are too spoiled and too uneducated to ever do anything except uh, live on the money that they have. So. Uh, uh, you know, there's a power of vacuums that are being created, and I think that these families are not filling it, and that other people will move in and uh, begin to exercise some power. One of your books you mentioned, the Council of Five. Yeah, the Council of Five, yeah. Changes. Oh, there's, there's changes in that. Uh, they still represent the same power sources, but uh, that uh, personnel changes almost, uh, well, every couple of years, because uh, the people on that council, uh, at the time when I wrote about it, they were, uh, they were probably, well, Guy de Rothschild was one, and I think he's died now. And uh, uh, there again, attrition takes its uh, toll, and that uh, uh, it's, it's harder and harder to find uh, good replacements. Because there's got to be ability to be on a council like that and decide uh, uh, world programs, which they have to do, yes. We were, we were sitting here discussing during when you were having your break, and we were saying how there's no young people in global science, there's no young people anywhere mm -hmm. anymore, and, and we were saying how the, they have been so dumbed down, they don't oh, yeah. have any history, it's very sad, they're not here, but it's really refreshing to think that the Rockefellers are having the same problem, their kids don't give a rat. Oh, that's nobody. absolutely true, no question about that's it. That's the good thing. Oh, that's the good part. That's the good part. Well, the other part is that some, you know, so many young people are getting interested in the Internet, yeah, because there it's quick information yeah. and they don't have to go to the library to study for years and so forth. So uh, uh, I, th I think young people will be, get, will be more interested in through the computers more than anything else. And uh, th that's a very promising sign. 
But, uh, you know, it, it's like the uh, Berlin Wall. Nobody predicted, uh, no government official ever predicted uh, that that was going to fall. Uh, they claimed to be totally surprised, the CIA and so forth. And in fact, they were quite disappointed because, of course, all of the support for communism has come from this country anyway, the CIA and the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. So uh, they would like to see the wall stay up forever, but uh, the people over there just got fed up with it and said, we're going to tear this down, and when they did, nobody stopped them. <laughs> and that sort of change can happen here at any time. It's really, uh, uh, people just get fed up, say, well, I've, I've put up with this for 38 years, and tomorrow it's over. <laughs> And However, right. when we come out of the system, when we refuse to take part in the system any longer, right? Oh, definitely, yes. Any independence that you assert is a positive step toward the future. People not paying taxes. Uh, I go to the court and uh, challenge the government, on, I challenge the IRS or anybody, and uh, uh, they're really dumbfounded because you're not supposed to be able to afford it in the first place. Mm -hmm. They have the legal s system set up that to talk to a lawyer about anything, uh, you got to put fifteen or twenty thousand dollars up before you'll even do anything. Well, you can go right down to the court and file your own case for one hundred and fifty dollars, and then you're in business. Uh, the court has to hear it, and uh, uh, you can file any motion that you want. I used to be very creative on my motions. Uh, <laughs> Sounds like it. Oh yeah, and uh, I used to file things that uh, really drove them wild because they weren't equipped to handle it. They hadn't seen anything like that. Uh, what they had was a very mundane, routine business. They'd file motions two sentences long, you know. Uh, for the money they were charging, they could have done a little more work, but they had gotten accustomed not to doing any work. So I'd file a nine or 12 page motion. And uh, in law, you've got to be very careful because one comma can change everything. So they had to wade through all this stuff with a fine tooth comb and try to decipher my references in foreign languages and all that sort of thing. I was having great fun with the whole thing. It's like George Gordon said, if you're in court and you're not having fun, you shouldn't be there. <laughs> <laughs> and they knew that uh, my financial commitment was very little. In fact, they used to, uh, the attorneys for the uh, city and county that I sued, they, they would stand up and scream for attorney's fees, attorney's fees, Your Honor. And it, uh, judge would say, I can't award attorney's fees. And, uh, and they'd jump up again a couple of minutes, attorney's fees, attorney's fees. And uh, this was all intended to intimidate me. And I was never awarded any attorney's fees for the simple reason the court cannot award attorney's fees against a plaintiff, which I was always a plaintiff, uh, <coughs> greater than the fees of the other side. Uh, and my attorney's fees were nil because I had no attorney. <laughs> So, so they couldn't award attorney's fees because it has to be equitable. And they knew I had no attorney's fees, so the judge said, I, I'm not awarding attorney's fees against Mr. Mullins. But it was intended to scare me to death because you can get stuck in a small case for attorney's fees of thirty or $40,000, which is a lot of money. And uh, I never had that problem. Yes? When was the last year you filed a 1040? Oh, I filed a 1040 every year because I have to renew my claim on my $85 million in default judgments against the government. I have to keep on alive. No, no, I, I'm, I even file and uh, send it uh, uh, certified mail and uh, the whole bit because I have to keep uh, those judgments alive, and that's how you do it. I notify the IRS and the FBI every year about those judgments, but uh, that's a technical thing with me because I want my money. I file a 1040. Well, I file a 1040 because I want my money. And, and when they open it up, there's no money in there. <laughs> you know, I don't send them anything because if they owe me money, I don't owe them anything. So, uh, no, I'd have everything to lose by not filing a 1040 or being out of the system because, uh, uh, like I say, I want my money. <laughs> Do you have a law degree? Uh, no, but I've been in the courts for 50 years. I've handled every case. I've been before every court except the Supreme Court. I don't bother with the Supreme Court because it's totally political. Oh, totally. And uh, they, wouldn't, they wouldn't bother with me, so why should I bother with them? Mm -hmm. so I go to the U.S. Court of Claims, the U.S. Appeals Courts, uh, mm -hmm. the federal courts, state courts, even local courts. And uh, <clears throat> the way the system is set up, 
anything that you file with the court has to be taken seriously, has to be considered. They can't say, well, here comes this nutcase Mullins again, uh, because they have to uh, take it very seriously. And uh, otherwise, they would uh, uh, make a joke of the whole system. So any case that I file is as legitimate as any case ever filed before that court. It has to be handled the same way. So, uh, well, listen, we don't want to uh, run too much overtime here, so uh, I... Uh, Thank you so much. Oh, I, I'm so glad you all came tonight. Oh, we loved it. And I have a few books left, and I'll be here tomorrow all day. So if you want to come by my table, I'll, uh, we can talk some more, and uh, uh, you may think of something uh, tomorrow that you'd like to ask, and I'll be right here, because I don't have any more talks scheduled. Touch with you on the end.